because I'm just going to walk out. I'm not going to say anything. I just can't vote on it. They would literally How many do we call need the Vatican. Four? Do we need seven? Good morning. If I can please bring the meeting to order. Uh, we need to begin immediately <laughs> because we're now 15 minutes behind. Um, welcome everyone to meeting number 11 of the Board of Health. Uh, we want to welcome all the members of the Board of Health, all the members from City Council who may be visiting, and of course a big welcome to uh, the members of the public. Uh, for those who are following the agenda, uh, you can do so on your computer, tablet, or smartphone uh, at www.toronto.ca uh, backslash city council. The Board of Health acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, I recognize that we have a fairly um, a small agenda uh, with only four items on there, but we do have a number of deputants uh, who are uh, going to be joining us. Uh, what I'd like to do is just go through uh, the, the agenda and see if there's going to be any particular members who would like to hold uh, this, uh, uh, hold any item for discussion or debate. Um, I also want to um, 
before we go into that, just uh, send a very special congratulations to our chair, uh, Councillor Cressy, who is actually not with us today because he and his wonderful wife, um, uh, Grace have welcomed a brand new born son. Uh, his name is Jude, which uh, I know you're all going to have that same song rattling around in your head now, uh, as uh, as I do whenever I think of his name. Uh, if I could, Councillor. Of course, yeah. Councillor. Um, Chair Cressy just sent me a text to make sure I send his regrets to the committee uh, for not bringing the baby in and showing the baby off. Okay. That is given that it's just under a week old, I'm sure all the doctors in the room would agree that's probably not. That's right. the best yeah. approach. Okay, but as long as he prom promises to bring Jude in very soon. Um, so yes, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Layton. Uh, and there is uh, just a, a little informal thing. There's, there's a card floating around. If you see it, please uh, sign it, anybody who's a member of the Board of Health. Um, so I'm going to go through the order paper. Uh, we will hold the first item, HL 11.1, Community Violence in Toronto, a Public Health Approach. Uh, we will hold that for uh, speakers. Then we have the second item which is HL 11.2, the power of investing in early years. I understand that, uh, Kate, uh, you, are, you have a motion, but I also see Sue's hand going up. Are you like to hold that? Yeah, okay, so we'll stand that down. And uh, our third item is HL 11.3, Toronto Public Health Capital Variance, uh, budget variance for the nine months ending uh, September 30th, 2019. Uh, the recommendation from the Medical Officer of Health is to receive the, this report for information. Uh, you've all had a chance to review it. Are there any uh, members who are interested in holding the item down for questions or debate? Seeing none, if I can get a member to move that. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Wong. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is received. Thank you. Uh, HL 11.4, Toronto Public Health operating var budget variance for the first for the nine months ended September 30th, 2019. Again, the report is before you. Uh, anyone interested in holding this item? Seeing none. Uh, recommendation is to receive. Moved by Councillor Layton. All those in favour? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. So, uh, just moving to the top of the agenda again. Um, we have lots of speakers, and uh, and I want to just uh, note that we may be the board of health uh, may be losing quorum at about 12:30, and we know that it's very important for us to, to deal adequately uh, with the first item. Uh, what I am going to propose to the members of the board of health is that we actually uh, limit the speaking time, not just ours but also the deputants, uh, so we all have only four minutes. Uh, normally, what happens is that they limit it from five minutes to three minutes. I think that we could try to sneak in a full four minutes and uh, and still be able to. Uh, uh, complete the agenda items that are before us without uh, losing quorum. Uh, if we lose quorum, we obviously won't be able to finish the meeting. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not something that we prefer, but uh, we're doing everything we can to not go down to three minutes. Are there any um, uh, uh, questions about that? Otherwise, uh, I would just simply move that as a procedural uh, matter. If I can put that, put that on the screen. So that the speakers who have not pre-registered be allowed to register to speak until 11, until 10 a.m. on November the 12th, uh, after which no further registrations are allowed and the speakers list be closed. The length of presentations from the public be limited to four minutes. The questions uh, to speakers from the Board of Health also be limited to four minutes. So we're all going to cap a little bit of our speaking time. Okay. Any question of the mover? All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. Uh, can I please have declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Are there any members? Okay, seeing none, uh, can I please have someone move the confirmation of the minutes from October 28th? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Wong. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Um, okay. So, we're just heading back into the list of speakers. Uh, please, uh, if I can just remind members of the public, if you are here to speak to item number one, uh, please uh, let us know. If you're not already registered, we want to get you on the list before 10 a.m. Okay. And our first speaker, I'd like to call up Dr. Annette Bailey uh, from the Daphne Cockwell School of Nursing, Ryerson University. Welcome. 
Yes, uh, very nice to see you. Uh, any one of those three microphones, there is a little button right in front of you. If you want to press that, the red light will go on, means your microphone is on and hot. And uh, I will start your clock. You can see it on your left-hand side. Okay. Thank you. I want to thank you very much for uh, the invitation to speak today, and I'll try to keep it at four minutes. Um, as I prepared for, for this uh, talk today, I thought about a young man who uh, was 16 years old when I interviewed him for a recent study that I did on youth trauma and gun violence. This young man spoke about the loss of his older brother and six of his friends to gun violence in the city of Toronto. He described how these losses altered his mind and put him on a path of vengeance. He spoke solemnly and decisively about the need to exercise what he called alternate justice on the persons responsible for the death of his brother. He ended his conversation with me by saying, I'm living on borrowed times. And six months later, he was shot to death. This young man's story is not very different from the many other youth that I interviewed who had lost friends and family members to gun violence. What was critical in all of their story is trauma. We know that a number of adversities and stressful events can accumulate into trauma impact and have devastating social consequences. My research showed that as these youth lose more and more friends and family members to gun violence, in the midst of dealing with social disparities in prioritized neighborhoods in Toronto, their trauma grows exponentially. As they grapple with trauma from day to day, it changes who they are. It alters their minds, their view of themselves, and their view of the world. It modifies their perspectives and their behaviors and it just shift them um, considerably. So when I was asked to describe what trauma is like, I go back to uh, Gary Newman um, comparison. And Gary Newman worked with Breaking the Cycle um, in Toronto for many years. And he said that trauma is kind of like um, the drinking and driving commercial where one glass is put in front of the other to show how it, um, one, when one becomes impaired, how it blurs their vision. And trauma is kind of like this for many of the youth who lose friends to gun violence. The continuous experience with trauma um, makes it easy for them to pick up a gun because they're not quite seeing well enough. So the research that I did showed that trauma experienced by these youth from losing loved ones to gun violence had the strongest link to further violence, stronger than other variables that I've assessed, such as poverty, the type of neighborhood they live in, unemployment, education. I've spoken with many youth who said that they've never considered picking up a gun or dropping out of school until they lost a loved one to gun violence. And so trauma, as I've come to understand it, is at the root of several retaliatory attacks, gun attacks in Toronto, and that it, it's destroying many um, Toronto families. And I know this because over 10 years, I have done research on gun violence prevention and survivorship in Toronto. I've interviewed several grieving mothers about the murder of their children, and I came to understand that gun violence is about broken hopes and dreams, deliberating, uh, debilitating grief and trauma, and the daily struggle to remain resilient in the face of trauma. Dr. Bailey, can I get your last uh, thoughts? And so my last thought would be to think, for us to think about gun violence, about being about people and about families and about communities, and to recognize that it's not just one group um, efforts to address in this community. Uh, currently, we see that uh, gun violence be, is being addressed primarily by the police. And what I'm proposing um, today is that we, we look at this as uh, bringing the mandate of law enforcement in a complementary partnership with public health, communities, 
and other stakeholders. And within this partnership, we can work to inform uh, violence prevention efforts, motivate policy changes, and uh, focus on important areas such as youth and family development, community services, and program development. Thank you very and much, so Dr. I thank you for your time and uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Bailey. Uh, are there any questions for the doctor? Thank you. Please stay there, and uh, you have a question from uh, 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 Sue Wong. So I think my mic is on. Okay. So given your comments to us and your data about the, the effects of trauma, how can we strengthen the report by the Medical Office of Health today that you've probably seen the nine recommendations? How can we strengthen those recommendations to address the issues about trauma? I think we need to focus on the root issue of gun violence. Um, we recognize that gun violence um, is, it comes from a, a system of poverty and trauma. And we see in Toronto that uh, youth are particularly affected. Um, and so there has to be a focus on youth development, family development, and family resilience. So I believe public health within its role um, to empower communities um, and to work together to bring families together has a significant role to play in addressing early childhood development issues, um, youth development issues, and family development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Anyone else for questions? Thank you, Doctor. Um, I'd like to call up uh, Dr. Wesley Krishlow from the Partnership and Accountability Circle Anti-Black Racism Unit, the City of Toronto. Hi. Thank you. Okay. And you have, you've brought a friend. Oh, that's a colleague who works with me, Aisha Francis, who runs uh, Families Impacted by Incarceration. And I'm on the list as well. She's on the list next, and we are going to speak together and leave together. She's next. Okay, oh, okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, are you sharing your time? Or are you going to be blending it together? Blending together, one, two, and three. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so thank you so much for the uh, opportunity, uh, Councillor Wang Tam and the Board of Health. Um, my name is Wesley Critchlow. I'm a member of the Partnership and Accountability Circle, which advises the City of Toronto's Anti-Racism Black Unit. So I'm here speaking today in the capacity of, of the Partnership and Accountability Circle and not as a professor. I do not represent my university today for the record. I want to speak to the complexity of issues which I think uh, we have seen in the criminal justice system. There's a corporate assault on black youth, and the corporate assault on black youth innocence. By extension, this means that black youth are denied any form of humanity which reflects an afterlife of slavery. Their continual situ situates black people as objects of fetish and force, according to Hartman and others. It perpetuates a denial of black humanity what Orlando Patterson identifies as social debt or enslaved peoples in which plays a foundational yet chronically neglected role in the American conceptions of boundaries to both humanity and political order. I believe that as we t engage in the discussion here today around gun violence, I'd like to focus primarily on the Gladue decision and the Ippoli decision to make an argument for similar forms of reforms within the context of the black community. Given that I have four minutes, I would, run to, I would shorten my time and focus on that. Um, the Glidwell decision, section 718 of the Criminal Code, 1999, and the Ippoli decision, uh, 2012 decisions, and the creation of, which formed the creation of Gladue Courts. Reforms to Canadian sentence in law in 1996 in the Supreme Court of Canada decision in R versus Gladue advises lower courts to consider an indigenous offender background and make sentences and decisions accordingly based on section 7182 of the criminal code. I'm arguing that we need something similar in the black, similar in the black community where we need to take into account, into account the context of black people's lives and the history of black people's oppression in this country in particular as it pertains to anti-black racism and colonialism. The Gladue and Ippoli decisions along with subsequent decisions extends the relevance of contextual inquiry by making courts responsible for taking judicial notice on how an accused behavior is situated within histories of racial, colonial, and systemic discrimination. To address the problem, I argue that we must uh, form pre, pre uh, this is how you have Gladue courts, I would like to argue we should have uh, pre-incarceration courts for black young men 
in, in particular in, impacted by the criminal justice system within the community and outside of the criminal justice system with community elders and experts who can intervene and give expert testimony witnesses about the conditions of black people's lives as mitigating factors for why these issues are occurring. Violence is also state sanctioned and therefore violence is not subjected just to an individual. We also have to see the state as having a responsibility for producing violence in black people's lives. Sentencing is an individual process, and in each case, the consideration must continue to be what a fit sentence is, of course. And I'm not saying that the due courts for black folks is a card out of the system. I'm saying there are the mitigating factors and ways in which we can reduce the sense of hopelessness that many black men feel in relationship to the criminal court systems. To that end, I'm saying that the weaponization and the continued everyday spiral of violence that black men experience and, reluct and their reluctance to talk about interpersonal violence and other traumatic experiences can be addressed in a more informal, ju non-judicial ways in which we can get at these experiences of trauma or victimization. The Doctors Against Violence the, and other medical groups who, uh, uh, who see black men on, on, on the operating table can also be act, used as experts in these courts to talk about the impact that this have on not just only uh, the, the individuals, but also themselves as doctors in, in terms of how they're impacted by these uh, well-documented examples of, of, police, of um, violence that comes before them. We have to develop a new lexicon, a conceptual vocabulary and community praxis for understanding the violence of hypermasculinity of disenfranchised young black men living in Toronto community housing. These young men's lives are defined by their struggles to adapt, cope, and resist normalized state, state structural violence, according to Galton, and conditions of social debt. These conditions can be eliminated if we try to humanize the way we interact with them. Hence, traumas are caused not only by structural disinvestment, but also by an amplification, as in feedback loop, when some individuals react to the structural violence, including gang and interpersonal violence. So failure to offer meaningful responses to repair state and socially societally induced traumas if indeed the state does not consider as functional the crisis conditions it has created. This leaves many young black men to carve out a worthwhile existence in which that makes sense to them even through those surrounding structures suppresses adaptive responses. Okay. Wesley, I believe that- Wesley, sorry to interrupt. Um, I just recognize that you're at five minutes. Are you guys sharing your time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll move to my recommendations. Um, this is a big, big report, and I think asking us to speak to the report today is good, but I think a debriefing of the report with potential community speakers for deputants could be a nice way to enhance the kind of delivery we make today so many of us can understand the complexities of how city governments work and provincial governments work. Because when we come to speak today and not having the context of how governments function, the role of the medical officer, et cetera, et cetera, we may be speaking out of context. And I think that that in itself could be form as, uh, seen as a form of structural violence. So we need to find ways to address that so that when deputants come to speak, they are not subjected to further violence and in, in, in hopelessness. Um, the, I believe that we need to talk about pre-gang syndrome, post-incarceration syndrome, and so that when we talk about these things, we, are, we can more or less get at the questions and issues around trauma that impact men and women who are Im impacted by the criminal justice system. Many young men in the criminal justice system are victims of violence and will not come out and talk about what their experiences have been. And these, these, these forms of violence can be, uh, expert, could be sort of uh, taken on in, in different forms of trauma, addictions, mental health, and not be attended to. How can black people uh, resist post-incarceration syndrome be a mitigating factor for consideration in the kind of cases that they reoffend. So similar to the Gladu decision, I'm asking that we improve our understanding of that situation and that we ask medical officers and every level of government to work with us to begin to form community clinics uh, within the, the various communities impacted by these uh, forms of violence as mitigating clinics for before many of these youth be go before the criminal justice system so that we can address their needs and not simply throw them into incarceration. When one is incarcerated, the, the social inclusion into life ex is excluded. Um, I would stop there for now because um, I, I know that uh, my partner wanted to say a few, there's two minutes, and uh, thank you so much. Hi, and so I'm Aisha, and I have an organization called Project Restore Phoebe. We work with families that are impacted by incarceration. And uh, just a couple of things that I'll highlight giving the uh, time 
constraint now. Um, in the look of my uh, there was a report that came out, look at my life. Um, the key finding was that the state of the family was an important factor contributing to the decision to pick up a gun. Specifically noted was the need to mitigate adverse childhood experiences, that incarceration was linked to chaotic and broken homes, and that issues such as fatherlessness, lone parent homes, and teenage parenting were also indicators. We also, as an organization, conducted research with mothers who had either a spouse or child that were incarcerated, and we are working with individuals that sit on both sides of this issue. Um, and so two key finding, findings were that due to the stigma, there was a lot of isolation that was self-imposed or societal. Um, and that access to services and supports were either non-existent, inadequate, or inappropriate because there was a lack of understanding of the key issues and the root of the issues. And in some cases, when they were seeking services, they were deemed ineligible for services. One of the other things that we've noted is that families need to be equipped in order to deal with and support individuals that are on, are on either side of this issue. Restoring the stability of a family is important and fundamental to, the, to address community violence. There is nothing individual about this issue. Therefore, services and support must adequately and appropriately reflect a more holistic family-centered approach towards prevention and intervention. Um, the last thing that I will say is that um, the academic work and clinical research we have been involved in support some of these recommendations, but to Dr. Critchlow's, um, what Dr. Critchlow said, there needs to be a deeper exploration and, and more partnership in moving forward. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to, uh, don't go away, uh, there may be questions from, from you from the directors today. Any questions from the speaker? Um, I, actually, I have a question. I want to clarify. Um, clearly, what I'm, I'm drawing from you, sorry, I'm just going to start my time, my own time. Um, <laughs> clearly, from what I'm hearing from you is that uh, the report is a, is, 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 is a decent foundation that's been laid, um, but you feel like we need to dive a little bit deeper to have an intimate conversation uh, with the, in particular, I'm going to say the black community mm -hmm. uh, and the medical officer of health mm -hmm. based on the recommendations to understand uh, why the recommendations are coming out the way they, they are. Yes. And, and in particular, you want to be able to provide her some provide her with some feedback, is that correct? Yes, yes. And, and what would that sort of consultation look like? Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and can we get it done quickly? Because this Yeah, um, is, I, I think the report as is, is a good medical report for medical officers to read and understand and for city officials. Um, you need an education on how city functions to read a report. I think we can simplify the report in a summary form with points A, B, C. Um, the city of uh, our confronting anti-black racism unit here can also work with the medical officer around a, a number of recommendations, one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, four, one, four, two, five, one, six, three, twelve, one, thirteen, sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen. These are all recommendations in, in, that, in the action plan that I think we can work with medical officers on. Um, the, the questions of black trauma-informed courts and black trauma-informed community clinics Something has to be done around these issues and mentioned in the community, and not just simply talk about trauma in an in 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 abstract sense, but we need to get specific to trauma that impact black communities. Uh, and we, we cannot continue to have these reports talk about violence in a generic way. We have to disaggregate the data and the impacts of this, 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 that disaggregated data and its impacts on black communities. So I think uh, I would like to also recommend that somehow the, the medical officer call a meeting with the black community and various agencies to do that and to consider how we can uh, move forward with this uh, in terms of working with not just the city but also all levels of government and politicians involved. Okay, thank you very much. That is very helpful. Anyone else with questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Wesley, good luck catching that train. Thank you. Okay. I know he's on a tight timeline. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Gary Thompson. Gary? When you're ready, I'll put, put your clock on. Good day, brothers and sisters. Remembrance Day always reminds me of Major General Smedley Butler's War is a Racket, read to the tune of veteran Navy uh, Tara Weston's 
remake of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. Quote, you thought it'd be much better back home, did you? Quote, Leonard Cohen. And every breath we drew was hallelujah. Seems we have quite a racket going on in Toronto and the rest of Canada, perpetuating mental and physical violence. Quote from the Board of Health recommendation number two, to inform the community safety and well-being plan by bringing public health perspective to and identifying other relevant issues. Number three, the Board of Health reference, engaging children and youth in the development process. Children instinctively know what millions of Canadians have been trained increases morbidity and mortality to anyone who is alive. Lost of trust in authority by your children, they may run wild. Coroner's inquest, Brad Chapman, Elaine de Villa under questioning. I am not a resuscitation expert. Ask the nurses, they know what to do. And Premier Doug Ford's policy is costing people their lives. Myself under questioning trespass charges at City Hall. Uh, Crown Attorney, Mr. Thompson, why do you keep going back to Toronto Public Health? Because they teach a life-threatening first aid treatment. Your Honour, we're dropping all charges. You're free to go, Mr. Thompson. I'm sitting on the stand. You're free to go, Mr. Thompson. You gave me paperwork that brought me here. I want paperwork that says I can go. Mr. Thompson, there is no paperwork. Just go. Kangaroo courts and a mad tea party right in front of me. May I suggest you stop? Self-induced violence creates a butterfly effect, making everyone physically and emotionally ill, increases violence, drug use, and abuse. Your body language alone gives you away. Have a great day, doctors and everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry about that. I was just um, reviewing some amendments with the with the clerk. Um, are there any questions of the speaker? Okay. okay, seeing none. Gary, thank you. Our next speaker is Odette Shepherd, United Mothers Opposing Violence Everywhere. Odette, I see you. Nice to see you. Hi, good morning everyone. Good morning. So I'm, I don't have a professional presentation. I'm just speaking as a mother who lost a child. So I'm the chair of a group called You Move, United Mothers Opposing Violence Everywhere. And it comprises of a number of mothers who have each lost a child to acts of violence. So my only child, he was 19 years old, he was murdered in the city of Toronto. And you ca I cannot explain the pain of loss that still carries me through day to day. Just thinking of talking here just created so many painful emotions that I want you to bear with me. And when you see the ugly face, just, just ignore it. So there's so many mothers like myself, who have lost a child or children to acts of violence. And you never get over. People tend to think that as time goes by, time is the greatest healer, but that's not true. Because grief is not an event. Grief goes on with you for the rest of your life. So many mothers, the blood of their children just crying out from the ground, crying out for justice, justice that never comes because justice delayed is justice denied. They say that justice is like a soothing balm that heals the wounds that we suffer. But when justice is not served, these wounds leave gaping holes. 
and you go on day by day, you're living, but you're never alive. And when you think of, I think, dealing with this, we all need to come together with cords of mutuality. We are all branches on a tree called humanity, and we need to be our brother's keepers. Our village is broken. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to make people feel whole. And when the village is broken, our lives are broken. So it's important that we, we take care. The health of our individuals is part of that broken village. I've spoken with many mothers who, have, who cannot get over this trauma. One mother in particular, her son was, was just a, a good boy, just doing whatever he can to make a life. And his brother ended up being shot. Now he, in turn, because his trauma was never dealt with, he, in turn, decided to take up a gun um, and cause the same gun violence. So it's important that we deal with people through their trauma. My own son's dad, people were all concerned about me and never even paid attention to him. And two years after my son died, he said to me, nobody ever asked me how I'm feeling. You know, his brother. I don't know if you guys know Jamal McGlure. As big, as manly as Jamal thinks he is, he was bawling like a baby. And he never, unless you have the financial ability or you have a workplace that takes care of your help to go through these traumas, people are just left, just trying to deal with it on their own. And that's not right. We need to do better than this. I can even think for my own self, People, because my son's murder was pretty high profile and I'm in the community trying to make a difference so some other mother doesn't have to go through this, it continues. And it puts me back every time some child gets murdered. It puts me back to a place where I don't want to be. Parents always seem to find me, to find me to ask about coping, about funeral arrangements, about things like that. And even for me, there's something called compassion fatigue because I feel like I need to be able to help these people. I need to be able to find a solution. I need to be able to be that fixer. So you end up showing up for people, but then nobody shows up for you. And I'm not saying that I need um, any sort of um, health um, or trauma help. I'm, I'm trying day by day to, to do the best I can to live the life, the best life that I can. But there are many people out there, they're lost. I know of one particular mother, she was just so broken. She ended up getting breast cancer as a result of the stress and the trauma and the, the pain that she endures through this situation. So unless you've been there, like, you know, we try to do whatever we can. We've already been through our situation and we're trying to do what we can so that each one of you, you don't have to go through that situation. But it's important that you pay attention and it's important that you try to put in place the necessary help. And I, when I say help, I don't mean these therapists that go through a textbook and think that you're okay. Real trauma-informed help that is not expensive, that people don't have to to sell their house to pay for. This is what I want to talk about today, okay. that it's very important that we take accountability for our brothers and our sisters. I don't know how much Thank time. you very much. Uh, you're almost two minutes over, but... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. <laughs> okay, thank I, you. I, I didn't want to cut you off because I, I, I know how... I, first of all, thank you very much for, for appearing before the, the, the board. Um, before you go, I just should, I should open up and ask the board members if they have any questions of, uh, of your deputation. Seeing none, thank you very much once thank again you. for coming out. Okay. Um, so, so I think many of you will recognize I have not been a very good chair with the clock and timer. Um, I, I recognize I also moved the motion limiting the speaking time to four minutes. I'm going to do the very best I can to adhere to that. I know it's also extremely difficult just because of the subject matter that we're coming uh, to speak about today. So um, I'm going to ask uh, our speakers to also maybe do a little bit of, uh, of self-monitoring. The clock is on your left because um, it's very difficult for me to cut you off um, when, when what you're saying is so important. 
Um, okay, so, and, but if I have to, I will slap the gravel down. Um, our next speaker is Alison de Groot, a Canadian Sporting Arms and Ammunition Association. Alison, are you here? Great, thank you very much. And Alison, you've brought some friends. Are and they are my technical experts. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Sorry, in case the board has questions that I'm. No, that's great. Of and Allison, you're the, but you're the only person listed to speak right now. Correct. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, the, again, the the rules are the clock is on your left hand side and begin when you're ready. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair and members of the Board of Health. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Allison De Groot. I am the managing director of the Canadian Sporting Arms and Ammunition Association, or CSAAA for short. Uh, to provide some context for my remarks today, I want to clarify that the CSAAA represents licensed business owners in the sporting arms industry in Canada, including Canadian manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers, retailers, and gunsmiths. We do not, we, while we support licensed firearms owners as they are our customers, we do not speak for them. We are only speaking on behalf of our business members. Uh, the CSAAA is a nonpartisan, industry-led organization governed by a volunteer board of directors elected from and by our business members. We do not accept any government funding, nor do we provide any political endorsements or funding. We offer our industry's technical expertise, knowledge of the legal firearms marketplace, as well as feedback on the efficacy and economic impact of firearms policy as a resource to all levels of government on behalf of our small business owners. For your perspective, there are 4,500 licensed firearms and ammunition businesses in Canada. The vast majority of these businesses are small, privately owned, family operated. Uh, these businesses collectively employ some 48,000 Canadians. According to the Conference Board of Canada's most recent report on the economic footprint of angling, hunting, trapping, and sport shooting released in July of this year, 426,000 Ontario residents participate in hunting, 369,000 Ontario residents participate in sport shooting. Ontario consumers spent $2.7 billion on hunting and sport shooting. Hunting and sports shooting contributes $1.9 billion to Ontario's GDP. Hunting and sports shooting support 15,000 full-time equivalent jobs in the province of Ontario. And in 2018, the province of Ontario collected $454 million in tax revenue from these two activities. And finally, for your background and directly relating to the City of Toronto, both of which are, sorry, I, there are two significant sporting arms businesses located in the city of Toronto proper, both of which are members of the CSAAA. Uh, North Silva is Canada's largest sporting and law enforcement firearms and ammunition importer and distributor. North Silva has been owned and operated by generations of the Savarino family for more than 50 years. In addition to supplying sporting arms retailers across the country, North Silva also supplies the RCMP, the Ontario Provincial Police, the Toronto Police Service, and numerous other municipal police services. North Silva employs 50 full-time staff here in the City of Toronto, and with me today is Dixon Lee of North Silva. Also with me today is Brian uh, Karusica from Al Flaherty's Outdoor Store. Al Flaherty's is the only independent sporting arms retailer in the city of Toronto. There is only one. Al Flaherty's has been family owned and operated for more than 70 years. We are here today because the decisions you make and the recommendations you make directly affect these business owners and their employees, and also because we want to make sure that you are making fully informed decisions. First, we would like to commend the Board of Health for recognizing that the City of Toronto has a serious problem with criminal gun violence. We applaud the Board for its recommendations to better identify, collect, and review data on community violence. Can I get your final thoughts, please? I'm sorry, yes. Um, our business owners are not mental health experts, nor are we experts on criminal gang activities. We are, however, working with the... Uh, I'll just go on to our main points. Uh, on item number five, the Board of Health urged the provincial government to ban the sale of handgun ammunition in the City of Toronto. 
And just so you are aware, with the exception of some very unique, often older types of ammunition for very specific handguns, there is no such thing as handgun ammunition. Almost all modern ammunition can be used in either handguns or rifles, including single shot hunt hunting rifles. Thank you. There may be questions of you from members. Uh, are there any member uh, questions for the deputant? Uh, Councillor Layton. Could you describe what a straw buyer is? Absolutely. Uh, we are in fact working with the RCMP to develop straw purchasing awareness training for our retailers. Straw purchasing is when a uh, licensed firearm owner uh, purchases on behalf of a non-licensed uh, person. Uh, it is illegal in Canada for a licensed firearm owner to purchase a firearm for someone else. So an individual can purchase guns and then sell them on the black market? Correct. So and very are, often, these are guns that were acquired legally in the country, but correct. can end up committing crimes. Correct. And this is a growing problem, correct? Um, it is a minimal uh, problem. It is very hard for retailers to identify. Very often, gangs will target new Canadians, pay for them to uh, get their PAL, which costs over five hundred dollars. Um, and then send them into the store. Our retailers work daily with law enforcement uh, officials in their community as well as the CFO offices to self-identify. Uh, we are actually, as I mentioned, working with the RCMP N West Division to develop retailer training. But um, straw purchasing is very difficult for the retailer to identify because very sure. often a single individual will go into a store, purchase a single firearm, go into a different store. However, the chief firearms office sees all transfer requests for restricted firearms, which includes handguns, and should be able to correlate those. So, so you tried to make a characterization there about new Canadians being the ones being the straw purchasers. Justin Green, was he a new Canadian? I'm sure uh, I'm you're familiar aware. with the case, the University of Toronto student who bought 23 guns over the course of 22 months just a couple of years ago. Are either of you familiar? Was he a new Canadian? Are either of you familiar with that case? I'm no. sorry, I can't speak. Or Andrew Winchester, who bought 47 handguns in the GTA I and then can't sold them within six months? I can't is that, speak. Are, is it, was, was Winchester doesn't particularly sound like a new Canadian name. So I, I think, you've, I think I you've made a characterization you may want to be careful about making in the future. We are working with RCMP N West, and they are training us on how to identify and what to look for. Um, but I can't speak to the specific cases that you're mentioning. Any other questions for the speaker? Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. I have copies of the economic impact and additional uh, technical you information. You want to bring that over to the clerk? Uh, they can Certainly. also distribute that to the members. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is uh, Leben. Grebe Mikkel. Liben, nice to see you. Uh, you're from the Tabu Community Health Center. Uh, same thing for you. The clock will start uh, when you're ready and you'll have four minutes. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, it is a privilege and an honor to be here to um, add voice to uh, more significant voices, as we heard earlier on, from uh, people who are directly impacted, uh, and also some elders in our community, like my brother, Louis March, who is sitting at the back. Um, in general, what I would like to kind of present, and I have forwarded some documentation for you, is number one, we, we know the problem. The problem has existed for a very long time. It's sad that almost a generation is being wiped out um, and it's disproportionately impacting the black community. It's not slowing down and solutions are focused on the wrong end of the spectrum. Uh, there is an image on the presentation I provided where you're seeing a lot of people falling off a cliff. This is an image uh, that is um, provided by uh, uh, a person in, in, in the United States called Dr. Kamara Jones, who's really working on uh, issues around social determinants of health. You will see people falling down, and the, the, the focus is on the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff picking up the people who are falling off and dying. 
whereas, uh, as I will explain a little bit further, the attention and the focus for solution should be somewhere else. Um, there are already several studies that have been conducted, example, the roots of violence. Uh, we know the root causes of this problem. We do not need another study. I think the City of Toronto has shown leadership in not conducting studies after studies, but has taken recommendation from existing studies and developed the first anti-black racism action plan uh, in North America. And I think um, while commending the Board of Health to acknowledge and um, move towards addressing the issue of violence in the city as a public health uh, issue and problem, I think it's time for us to move into action. Uh, some of the things that have been already mentioned, uh, the issue of violence is uh, um, based on social determinants of health. Uh, we know poverty is a very underlying factor for some of the challenges that we see. Um, education and challenges in the education system, whether it's school dropout rates, expulsion and suspension rate, and access to post-secondary education are significant social determinants of health. Unemployment right now with youth unemployment in the black community is uh, the highest, um, even higher than the uh, traditional indigenous unemployment rate for young people. Uh, health disparities and particularly mental health that is not diagnosed, um, that is leading to a lot of challenges in schools or in the community. Uh, we have heard about the incarceration rate. So um, when we're thinking about the public health approach, we would like to focus uh, or recommend that uh, the Board of Health and, and the medical uh, officer looks at it from a system thinking um, perspective. Uh, usually when fundings are provided for young people, it's only for young people and leaves out the family, the community and other institutions. Um, investment around safety is always on the other end of the spectrum where we're talking about community safety and police investment when we don't have any equal um, and balancing act towards other um, upstream investment and prevention. In fact, when we're just focusing on community safety from a police perspective, it has produced a negative outcomes. So in terms of system thinking, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm proposing that we look at different uh, conditions for system change, whether it's policies, practices, or whether it is relationship in communities, or even mental health, um, mental models and assumptions that exist uh, that is based on anti-black racism. Your final uh, thought, please. And so finally, I would say, um, while, we're recommend, while we're supporting all the recommendations that are provided, we would like to add that community agencies and other volunteer organizations be considered to be part of the work in, to inform the community safety and well-being. Trauma-informed mental health services are required, but they need to be based in local community settings, devoid of stigma and accessible. Uh, accessible. And then uh, also, in addition to the plan, I think this, the Board of Health and the city should invest and or earmark financial and human resources to start doing action. There are already um, uh, evidence-based practices that are happening in the community where we can leverage um, pilot projects or whether this is scaling this up. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Uh, Director Wong and then Director McKelvey. I'm talking about. So with regard to the public health earmarking, the health, the human and financial resources, what amount are you asking for? I, I don't have a figure in mind, but I, for me and from the organization I came from, it's not so much the amount of money that is being earmarked or invested. It's so much about the, the uh, commitment to the cause. Okay. Uh, there are already existing services that volunteer organization with no funding are implementing. Okay. It's looking at those and you know scaling them up so that they have a broader impact. More opportunity. Uh, more opportunity for smaller organization. So we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have been doing this in the community over and over again, as you know. Yes. And so it's focusing on those that have impact and then scaling it so that we have broader impact and stronger impact in the community. So thank you for your presentation. Good work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and next to, to question is Dr. Uh, sorry, uh, Director McKelvey. 
Hi, thank you for coming in. Uh, my question is about, you, you mentioned, and I know you were short on time, but you mentioned that there were some pilots that you thought were very successful and could be examples of things that could be scaled up. Could you outline some of those for us? So uh, what, what, when we're doing work in the community, we're not just looking at violence, as I said, we're looking at the system. So is it the parents? How are they supported? What do they need in terms of um, equipping them so that they are better uh, available and doing what they need to do in a stronger way. Uh, so for example, I'll give you, we have a, 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 a school program that deals with expulsion and suspension rate that is focused on the black students. Uh, when we're delivering this program in schools, we're not just working with the black students who are being uh, impacted by school disciplinary measures, but we're also supporting their parents. We're working with the teachers and administrators. Uh, we're also providing them access to legal aid and service and information. Um, so when, when we're providing that, we're trying to all not just support the, the students who are going through this difficult, ch challenging situation, but we're also talking to the school and see if they can change some of the practices that they have. In a lot of cases, it is based on anti-black racism and bias and prejudice, whether it's how kids are, you know, youth are work, working in the school or how they're dressed or how they're responding in a certain way. So there are programs like that. We have uh, several after-school programs in the city that are run by different community centers. How about investing uh, in those so that we bring in this system thinking and making it more impactful as it relates to engaging with, with the education, with the employment, and, and criminal justice system? And your second recommendation is that trauma-informed mental health supports be located in less stigmatizing settings. Could you outline examples of this or, or where you think this needs to go? So, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in, in previous funding arrangements, usually around health and mental health, a lot of money goes into services that are not accessible by particularly black communities. It's either in hospital settings or large mainstream mental health institutions. And uh, number one, when we do refer young people or other people to access those services because of where they're located or because they are stigmatizing uh, being in a, in a very institutional uh, environment, uh, people cannot access them if they're, even though they are available. I think we need to move from moving those services if um, they exist. I think there is a lack of services, and you probably agree with me in Scarborough, there is a very, very lack of services around uh, mental health services, but everywhere in the city. And it's locating those places where traditionally young people and, and families are already accessing services, so that it's less stigmatizing when they come there. Nobody knows whether they're coming from for a mental health service or any other services. And locating them in those environments make it easy to access, but also it will be informed in the ways that that it is culturally appropriate for the services that they receive. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you have another uh, person who's interested in asking questions, and that is uh, Director Mulligan. Morning. Um, you mentioned the city's anti-black racism action plan. Uh, and when I'm looking through the recommendations here, I, uh, while it's mentioned in the report, I don't see in the recommendations any mention of anti-black racism or disaggregated and race-based data. Um, do you have a recommendation on how we might strengthen these in order to make a better connection to that work of anti-black racism? Uh, definitely. And, and I think if, if that language if the language is not there, that means nobody is going to pay attention to that. So I think we have to maybe follow from the city's uh, anti-black racism action plan and incorporate some of those recommendations. But I think if we are going to be dealing with violence, particularly that is impacting disproportionately black communities, I think the, the principle and the lens of anti-black racism should be part of that uh, implementation and recommendation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Anyone else for questions? Seeing none, thank you for your deputation. I'd like to call our next speaker, who is Dr. Greg Mostossi, Doctors for Firearms Safety and Responsibility. Welcome. And again, uh, the clock will be on your left-hand side, four minutes when you're ready. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm an emergency physician that works in London, Ontario at the Children's Hospital of uh, Western Ontario. I'm also an associate professor at Western University. I'm also a member of a founding member of a group that we started this year called the Doctors for Firearms Safety and Responsibility. Uh, just a little bit about my background. Um, I was present personally at the Montreal Polytechnic shooting uh, 
in 1989, where 14 women lost their lives. It affects me still. Uh, I had a two-year-old daughter and a seven-month-old son. At the time, I slept on the floor for six months uh, as a result of having been on scene pronouncing uh, the victims dead and uh, taking care of some of the injured afterwards. Uh, I'm also a, uh, a pistol shooter, a competitive pistol shooter and rifle and shotgun shooter. I'm a range officer in three different firearms disciplines. So I have a unique perspective to speak on your uh, point number six, which is the banning of firearms. Um, I'd like to just clarify that the assault weapons portion of it uh, is, is, in my opinion, redundant. Assault weapons are uh, weapons that fire in a fully automatic mode with high capacity magazines. Those are illegal and unobtainable by Canadians legally. Uh, they're issued to police and military only. Uh, the, uh, the issue of handguns and semi-automatic rifles, um, I think everyone probably knows some of the regulations involved in that, taking courses, taking months to obtain your license, having 24-hour background checks every single day by the RCMP. Uh, knowing that licensed firearms owners are actually the safer uh, in terms of violent crime statistics than the general public and in fact safer than off-duty police officers. Um, so uh, what, uh, the point I'd like to make with this is that a gun ban uh, actually affects licensed gun owners. It affects millions, literally there's 2.2 million licensed uh, firearms owners in Canada. There's many more, probably twice that number, that go out with licensed firearms owners to be supervised at ranges. There are ranges that take public uh, uh, shooting times when people can go and shoot. Many, many people go to the states to shoot in places without firearms licenses as a hobby uh, or for entertainment. Um, these aren't the people that uh, perpetrate the crimes. Uh, they're health professionals, they're lawyers, uh, politicians, they're uh, 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 blue-collar workers, they're ordinary citizens who have a passion for shooting, such as I do. Uh, my, my wife and two of my children uh, are also competitive shooters, and I have two kids in the military. So I make a very big distinction between the Ill illegal use of firearms and uh, the legal use of firearms and the peaceful use of firearms, which I advocate for and which my organization advocates for. I think the illegal use of firearms and the tragedies that we see here that I have also witnessed, uh, this mother who has lost a child, these are the issues we need to address, uh, not the issues that would uh, unfairly target millions of law-abiding citizens in this country. Uh, the issues that have been spoken about here with regard to social programs, youth programs, and enforcement programs, especially the very important point that Mr. Layton brought up about straw purchases, are the issues that we should be spending money on. The other issue we should be spending money on is mental health. I work in an emergency department where we routinely have 20 to 30 uh, psychiatric patients boarded in hallways that look like a 1950s dorm, head to foot, uh, stretchers with security guards on either end for days on end with very little health care. And these are people that have shown up in our emergency department uh, with suicidal ideation and intent. Uh, they don't receive the care they need. There's a huge shortfall in funding and services for these folks uh, who are victims uh, or potential victims of, of suicide uh, by various methods. Uh, in summary, Doctors for Firearms, Safety and Responsibility, we're here to educate, to put perspective on firearms, and to differentiate between the legal and illegal use of these uh, items. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Uh, Director Perks. Thank you very much for, for coming today, and I appreciate um, you telling us your story. My, my memory of the data is that uh, the presence of a firearm in a home uh, quintuples the likelihood of a accidental death of a child, uh, dramatically increases the rate of the, the likelihood of suicide in a, in a household, and also increases the likelihood of domestic murder in a household. Am I correct in that? I think not. Um, so suicide rates in Canada have been dropping uh, over the decades and continue to drop. I, I wasn't so talking about the overall So differentiating between firearm suicide and other fire, other suicide uh, is, I, th I think, clouds the issue. I think the issue is that we, for instance, uh, in, our, in my business, I've never seen, I have a family member who committed suicide by handgun, but other than that, I've never actually seen in my practice of over 30 I, I years. I wasn't asking about someone, your practice. I was yes. asking, doesn't the data and, and we've had this presented to Toronto City Council before. Yes. Support the claim that having a firearm in your home makes it more likely that a child will die 
in an accident makes it more likely that there will be a suicide in that household and makes it more likely that there will be a domestic murder in that household. It is, it is. And if compared to a household that does not have a firearm in it. Isn't that what the, the overall data shows? The overall data, unfortunately, you're spar and this is what we have to be very careful with, is you're parsing. That data is parsed from a very small data set. In other words, if you have, you know, five people committing suicide and four of them are by handgun in a situation where you have, you know, millions of people, then yes, you can show that there's a quintupling of rates. So if your rates quintuple and you go from, let's say as an example, one in 100,000, uh, and that quintuples to four in 100,000, it's still four out of 100,000. In other words, it's an extremely low number. These are extremely rare events that you're talking about. So if you decide to parse that by saying your, your risk quintuples, if your risk starts out at an, at an extremely low rate, then that quintupling of risk remains at ex an extremely low rate of events. Thank you. I, I wonder then, given that you've acknowledged that, how you, can you still stand by your claim that uh, gun owners are safer than the general public? Uh, the data does show that, and there is data to support that, yes, indeed. Not the data we just discussed. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions uh, for the speaker? Uh, Director Layton. Yes, I'm trying to learn a little bit more about this organization. Is it a member-based organization? It's very loose. It's basically, we got together, um, I, I wrote a, an op-ed for the National Post uh, outlining some of the points that I've just presented here uh, after another group in, here in Toronto uh, called for a gun ban. And so we wanted to, uh, and instantly there was a number of people we got together through Facebook and other connections um, who uh, wanted to speak up against uh, gun bans that were motivated, we felt, by a very local uh, situation that wouldn't be helped by gun bans. So it's a member-based organization? We don't sign up and don't have a membership list. We're not incorporated. You, you have a list of individuals on your website. Who are they? Uh, so we have trauma surgeons, we have ICU oh, but docs. But who are they, the ones that are listed on your website? Are what they your names? members? No, I'm just wondering who they are. Are they your board of directors? We, we don't have a formal organization, no. So they're, it's they're, loose. That's they're, what loose means. So the nine people are your, your organization, correct? Yes, those, those are the, nine individuals. Those that, are the core individuals. We so have your other individuals that we or? keep in touch with and who are on the social media thread who are physicians, nurses, uh, paramedics, and other healthcare so professionals. Who, who runs the website? Uh, we One have a website coordinator. We have a guy who's good in IT that runs the website. Because all of the information about who, who owns the, the URL has been redacted. So I'm just I wondering no, who I'm sorry, who you're asking the wrong person. I'm not an IT person and I'm not well, well versed in so, those. So maybe things. you can tell me. So the, the leadership of the organization, how is it run? There is no leadership. We just keep in touch and uh, we share information. So you have nine individuals. Excuse me, can I answer the question? Well, I'm uh, we, have, we have individuals who have various strengths. One, uh, a couple of the individuals have presented at Senate committees and are aware of the literature and are gathering literature and share that literature with us so that we can be science and evidence-based. So there's nine, mem nine core members of the organization and then you have someone that does your website. Yes. Is that one of those nine members, or is it a volunteer, or is it a paid person? Do you it's, have staff? It's a volunteer person who's good in IT. Is it one of those nine members? No. No, you, no okay. it's an IT person. Who? It's, it's all a bit of a mystery, but there's nine people involved. Let, let me clarify uh, in terms of expanding this. Uh, there was a petition uh, circulated for the banning of uh, firearms uh, in our department at London Health Sciences. The petition received no signatures in our department, the emergency department, very busy trauma center. And in fact, I was approached by many of my colleagues in the hospital at the time thanking us for coming out and outlining what the regulations are for firearms ownership, what the issues are for legal firearms ownership versus illegal firearms ownership. And in fact, many, many healthcare workers that I work with are legal firearms owners and shooters. And uh, none of us are picking up a gun to kill anyone. Well, we're about to hear from some emergency room physicians, so maybe you'll stick around to hear from them. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else with questions of the speaker? Seeing none, actually I have one final question, sorry. Doctor? I have one final question for you, just for myself as the vice chair. Uh, Dr. Mosdossi, um, what is the relationship between your organization and the Canadian Sporting Arms and Ammunition Association and in, and in general with the gun lobby? 
We have no affiliations. We're literally a loose group of physicians. Let me put into perspective, as healthcare workers, if we speak up in support of firearms, um, uh, in the peaceful use of firearms, the sporting use of firearms, then in fact we are vilified. One of the members that Mr. Layton has referred to was actually threatened with, uh, with job action because she simply spoke up in support of her, uh, her sport, which is... Uh, that wasn't my shooting. question. I just want to know what was your relationship, the, what was the relationship between your organization, the Doctors for Firearms Safety and Responsibility, and the Canadian Sporting Arms and Ammunition Association? What's the relationship between these two organizations and the organize, your organization and the gun lobby in general? We, we don't have, we do not have any connections to the gun lobby. Thank you. We don't have any connections to the business uh, organization that you just spoke of. In fact, I had, know very little about them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I um, appreciate that. Our next speaker is Charles J. Zack, Canada's National Firearms Association. Charles? Are you starting? Start speaking yet. Yeah, I can restart. I just thought you were ready. What? Good morning, members of the uh, Toronto Board of Health and members of the audience. My name is Charles Zatch, and I am the Executive Director of Canada's National Firearms Association. The NFA is Canada's longest standing and most effective gun rights advocacy organization. We represent the interests of law abiding Canadian firearms owners and users. The NFA is also the longest gun rights organization fighting for the rights of Canadians both domestically and internationally. I am here today because Canadian, gun, Canadian law abiding firearms owners are incensed that they continue to be unjustly targeted and scapegoated for the misdeeds of outlaws who brazenly misuse their illegal firearms due to failed public policy and government inaction. Urban criminal crime touches on issues central to Canadian life. As more residents are killed or injured in wanton criminal gunplay, community leaders are under the gun to find effective solutions. For the record, law-abiding Canadian firearms owners who live in these communities share the same goals. Toronto City Council has already waded into this ongoing problem by requesting that the federal government ban legal handguns and lawful purchases of ammunition in Toronto as a deterrence to ongoing criminal violence. The Toronto Medical Office Oh, sorry, the Medical Officer of Health has echoed the city's sentiment by also calling for a gun and ammunition ban. It is cited as recommendation five and six, as you know. In her supporting report titled Community Violence in Toronto, she cites, given the evidence related to access to guns, this report recommends that the Board of Health urge the federal government to place limits on the supply and access to the firearms. Although unlike many parts of her report, this particular statement has no citation to a source of substantiation in the references of the report. I have combed through all the presented attachments and cannot find any reference to an empirical study that concludes that banning legal firearms and ammunition sales will deter outlaws from acquiring illegal handguns and ammunition from the black market. This hypothesis of banning legal firearms and guns as a panacea for criminal uh, gun violence is not new. It has been tried in many urban centers and countries around the world. Most notable of these is Australia, New York, California, and Canada. Yes, Canada. In the 1990s, Canada enacted the Firearms Act, which is now the, the centerpiece of our current gun control uh, regime. A large number of previously legal firearms have already been restricted and banned. Subsequent research on the effectiveness of our gun control regime is now concluding that the type of firearm and control of certain types of firearms results in no reduction in firearm homicide or suicide. The ongoing criminal violence in Toronto proves this to be true. There has also been some concern that an increase in the legitimate ownership of restricted firearms, in particular handguns, has increased availability to criminal elements and consequently an increase in homicide. However, Regression analysis of the numbers of registered restricted firearms demonstrates no association between an increase in ownership or homicide. Our recommendation 
The evidence clearly suggests that gun bans result in no public safety benefit and should be discontinued as a pub public safety policy. The NFA calls on the Toronto Board of Health to reject the Medical Office of Health's recommendation to ban legal firearms and ammunition, ammunition sales on this basis. We are not the problem. Gun control is not crime control. Refocus your crime fighting measures on criminals, not the law abiding. Thank you for your consideration and the opportunity to speak before this esteemed board. Thank, thank you, you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Just on, Dr. On, that, on that statement, you're against all gun bans? Yes. Like assault rifle, you, you, you think we should walk that back? Is what? that something, is that a statement you're making? Sorry, what is an assault, assault rifle? A, like a, 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 a weapon, an automatic weapon. Uh, they're already banned. But, but you're saying that, that bans aren't effective. So do you think we should walk that back? We, we had automatic weapons in the I'm, 60s and uh, they were banned. There was no, there was you no, just, you, there was you, no result you made, in any You made a statement reduction. that said bans aren't effective. So yes. are you saying that we should walk back that ban on fully, autom uh, fully automatic already, weapons? I'll restate what I just said. I said that bans have no effect on crime control. Okay. Any other directors to question? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We are moving along. I would like to call uh, Randy Tandenbaum. Uh, Center for Injury Pre Prevention, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. Randy, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, honourable members of the Board of Health, for the opportunity to speak today about violence and violence intervention. And if I may also say thank you to the uh, previous speakers today for sharing their pain and their passion about this subject, as well as the ones that will follow. My name is Brandi Tannenbaum, and I'm a program coordinator at the Centre for Injury Prevention in the Tory Trauma Program at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. The Centre for Injury Prevention has a tradition of collaboration with agencies that support shared safety objectives. Within the City of Toronto, we've worked extensively with public health, fire, police and paramedic services on initiatives such as the Toronto Area Safety Coalition. Our longest standing collaborative program is the Prevent Alcohol and Risk Related Trauma in Youth, or PARTY program. We've been proudly delivering this injury prevention program to Toronto and GTA high school students since 1986. Our work is driven by statistics, and with the prevalence of violence, traumatic injuries, we strive to effect change within this cohort. At Sunnybrook, we've seen a rise in gun and stabbing injuries. In fact, these injuries have doubled over the last five years. While our past practice has been to deliver the highest quality of health care, repair injuries and return patients to community, we know more now and that we must do differently to ensure these patients have the best opportunity to move away from the underlying conditions that support violence in the first place. Simply, we do not want to see these young people come back with new injuries. And I must emphasize that our trauma team at Sunnybrook, where we see numerous cases each year, uh, sorry, I must emphasize the concerns of our trauma team at Sunnybrook, where we see numerous cases each year of patients who come back to us with new violent injuries. More than this, we want to see these patients thrive with the support they need to live long and healthy lives. To that end, we have developed a new hospital-based violence intervention program, or HVIP, to promote positive alternatives to violence in order to reduce retaliation, criminal involvement, and re-injury among youth injured by violence. Our program is called BRAVE, which stands for Breaking the Cycle of Violence with Empathy. HVIPs were first established in the 1990s and have proven effective in reducing violent injury reoccurrence, as well as saving the shared costs associated with the care of these patients. And this is evident in attachment six of today's agenda. A unique feature of these programs is the public health lens through which they operate. Like other public health issues, violent injury has identifiable factors or the social determinants of health that put people at risk or offer protection. We've done extensive research on successful program models from our counterparts in the United States, and we've also connected with our trauma colleagues at St. Michael's Hospital and SickKids. We've learned about the tremendous community agency resources developed right here in the City of Toronto, and we believe these existing programs can be leveraged and built upon to better support patients while in hospital. Specifically, we have connected with FOCUS and the Youth Development Unit. We're grateful these resources are in place and connecting with them has been incredibly positive. 
The hallmark feature of our BRAVE program, like other HVIPs, is the culturally competent case manager that is able to reach the patient in a critical time, often referred to as the teachable moment. It's in this moment that a patient can reflect on the factors that led to their health crisis. It's also in this moment that an alternative pathway can be offered that includes connection to community services and support to address the underlying conditions that perpetuate violence. The goal of BRAVE is to build a bridge for our patients through a culturally competent case manager from our hospital bed to focus the youth development unit and other community resources so that together we can enable the possibility of hope for a healthy future. Sunnybrook is poised to begin delivering this important program immediately upon securing the necessary resources to support the case managers. We know this program cannot work without a strong collaborative effort and public health approach, and we look forward to the opportunity to engage further with Toronto Public Health and the City of Toronto as we operationalize BRAVE. Thank you, Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the speaker? Okay. Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I would like to call Dr. Wendy Suke. And following that, we have Dr. Najma Ahmed. Thanks very much. It's uh, an honor to be here, and I appreciate um, you giving us the time to speak. I want to underscore um, a couple of things. First of all, uh, I'm the president of the Coalition for Gun Control. I'm also a professor at Ryerson University, and my book, The Global Gun Epidemic, was uh, written with Vic Seidel, who is the past president of the American Public Health Association. So for the past 30 years, I've been working on this issue. The public health perspective has been very important. And it goes without saying that I would echo many of the comments made by previous speakers about the importance of investing in primary prevention, about the importance of recognizing the costs of gun injury and death extending far beyond uh, the statistics that we often see to the uh, trauma experienced by families and, in fact, communities, and the importance of addressing those issues. But today I really wanted to focus on, on just a couple of things. One of them, which has been referenced uh, previously, is that within the public health model, there is recognition that in spite of the focus that is required on um, primary prevention, in spite of the focus that is required on treatment, on the justice system, we also have to look at the instruments of violence. The availability of firearms is shown through multiple studies over the last four decades to be associated with increases in lethality rates. The availability of firearms does not cause violence, but it results in violence having much more um, dire consequences, more people being injured, more people dying. And it, uh, Arthur Kellerman's uh, study about the impact of a gun in the home was earlier referenced. We also have data on an international basis as well as a national basis that re reinforces this. So for example, consider the case of Australia, the United Kingdom, the United States and Canada. When you take guns out of the equation, the rates of homicide without firearms, the rates per 100,000, roughly the same. You put guns into the equation, and the rate of homicides with guns in the United States is five times greater than it is in Canada, and about five times greater in Canada than it is in the UK. The UK, with 60 million people, had about 30 gun murders last year. The entire country had fewer gun murders than the city of Toronto. So the accessibility thesis really underscores, I think, the importance of looking at supporting a national ban on handguns and military assault weapons, including semi-automatic variants, because in contrast to the previous speaker, not all assault weapons are fully automatic. The other thing that I wanted to emphasize is in spite of the um, good intentions that perhaps underpin the notion of trying to encourage cities to acquire the power to prohibit 
um, the sale of, of handguns and the availability of handguns, there's very little evidence that those sorts of local measures will have the impact that is required because guns flow across open borders and because of the structure of power. So we would really encourage Toronto to join um, the other municipalities across the country that have called for strong federal legislation. And the final thing that I would, I would uh, like to say is that I think today you've seen evidence of a few things that are really important. Yes, One is the costs of gun violence, which affects many people beyond those who are actually shot and killed, and that, that point has been underscored. Uh, Ted Miller published an article in the Canadian Medical Association Journal a number of years ago that suggested that the costs of gun violence, and this was just looking at pure health economic costs, $6.6 .6 billion per year. And I would argue the costs go far beyond that, and the Department of Public Health could actually help us do a better job of documenting and measuring um, those costs. Thank you. The Actually, no, you're Five out seconds? No, I apologize. Nope. Okay. Uh, there may be a question from one okay. of the directors. Uh, the question coming from Director Perks. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the point you make on local bans, I just want to interrogate that a bit. I appreciate your point that guns flow. Yeah. I, I take that. Um, however, I wonder if you've thought a little bit about some of the other interventions boards of health have made and how that changes policy. So for example, this Board of Health, uh, together with a couple of others, uh, recommended a pesticide ban. It became a local thing, and then it became a province-wide thing to ban cosmetic pesticides. Similarly, uh, restaurant smoking and workplace smoking. City of Toronto took some initial steps, and then other municipalities followed, and then it became the norm, and higher orders of government took it on. Do you think there's a value in planting our flag and saying, we want other governments to follow? No. Oh. Um, there's a big difference between smoking and pesticides. You ban pesticides in a neighborhood, it has an immediate and measurable effect. You ban smoking in a building, it has an immediate and measurable effect. You ban guns in a city, it will not have an effect. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else to, uh, for questions? Actually, I have a, a question with respect to just following up that line of thinking. Um, the, during the federal uh, election, there was a there was announcement from the prime minister that he was uh, wanting to give municipalities the right to ban handguns, um, and uh, and I think what. And, and maybe that's seen as one form of downloading a, a responsibility to the city. Uh, who would who would enforce a municipal handgun ban uh, as you see it? Um. The same be, people who enforce parking bylaws? I don't know. Um, just on that point, though, I think we have to differentiate between evidence-based solutions and political solutions. That was a political solution. Handguns serve no purpose in rural communities any more than they serve in urban centres. And with respect to the, um, the claims from some of the previous speakers that uh, uh, that there are law-abiding uh, handgun owners uh, owning uh, any, anything from uh, semi-automatic rifles, the shooting rifles, right down to handguns, and that a national ban uh, and stricter gun control would actually punish those illegal owners. Uh, do you believe that is the case? I think you have to think about what punishment really is. I think losing a child is punishment, finding a new hobby is not. And I, I also think what has to be really um, emphasized is the story about law-abiding gun owners applies often until someone pulls the trigger. Most of the shooters in, in mass killings in this country and elsewhere, I, I regret to say, were law-abiding gun owners until they pulled the trigger. And that's true at the mosque shooting, that's true at the Dawson College shooting, that's true at the Polytechnic shooting, and it's certainly true in many instances of domestic violence. So those boundaries between the law-abiding folk and, and the others are really um, put all Canadians at risk. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I believe uh, Director Mulligan has a question. 
Yes, I was just hoping you could finish your thought about um, the role of the Medical Officer of Health in helping to um, track the costs and implications. Yes, I think one of the things, and I, I actually live in uh, uh, Gordon's um, ward, uh, sorry, Councillor Perk's ward, <laughs> but you would, would, would know, uh, e even in my neighbourhood, the, the experience of my daughter, who's very privileged, and the experience of the kid across the street are dramatically different in terms of their opportunities, but also their experience of violence and the threats that they have had to them personally. I mean, I know a kid across the street from where I live who was taken out of school for with his brother for more than eight months because of local gang-related threats. And his school, it, Western Tech, shares space with my daughter's school, Ursula Franklin. The lived experience of people in the city of Toronto with respect to gun violence is highly racialized and socioeconomic um, factors uh, play into it. And so I would really support the calls for more disaggregated data and more uh, research into trauma, the costs of trauma, the ripple effects of gun violence, because the statistics, in my view, mask much deeper costs. And we heard today, we heard today about the economic power of the gun lobby and, and, and the gun businesses in this country. And that's part of the reason why we have seen uh, the public policy agenda hijacked frankly, by a small percentage of self-interested individuals. We have to shift that balance by showing where the public interest lies and data can help us do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to call Dr. Najma Ahmed. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Najma Ahmed, and I'm a trauma surgeon at St. Michael's Hospital, and thank you for the privilege of the floor this morning. I'm here on behalf of Canadian Doctors for Protection from Guns. Uh, we are a grass grassroots advocacy organization. CDPG is a national organization comprised of primary care physicians, trauma surgeons, emergency doctors, rehab specialists, uh, to name only some of the medical professionals that we represent. We are also um, public health professionals, nurses, paramedics, psychologists from all over the country, from large urban centers, and from small rural communities. We have organized because we are alarmed by the escalating pace of gun violence, preventable gun violence that we are all witnessing. We are witness to the tragic um, deaths and long-term downstream effects that these preventable uh, injuries cause to families and communities. I would like to make the point that these bullets, the trauma does not stop when the bullets stop flying. Uh, the trauma reverberates for generations, um, and decades and generations through these families and these communities. We, CDPG, are pleased to support, uh, pleased to support the resolutions brought forward by the Medical Officer of Health today uh, to take a public health approach to community gun violence because indeed gun violence is a public health issue. We urge the Board of Health to take a harms reduction approach as dictated by sound public health principles. We urge solutions that minimize exposure to the injurious vector. In this case, in the case of gun violence, the vector of the disease is the bullet. It is the gun. Therefore, we strongly support the recommendations herein proposed to urge the federal government to prohibit all weapons with a semi-automatic firing mechanism, including semi-automatic handguns. And we fully support the emphasis and strengthening of community um, programs to address social determinants of health, including lack of educational opportunities exclusion of certain, and exclusion of certain groups from economic opportunity. We recognize that this motion relates largely to urban and community violence in Toronto. However, we would like to bring to the attention of this committee that women, and especially young Indigenous women, are of greater risk from femicide from gun than any other group of women in this country, and that is because of the proliferation of guns in those communities. We would also like to highlight the tragic issue of suicide by gun. These are preventable deaths 
About 75% of gun deaths in Canada are suicide, and suicide by guns are particularly lethal, resulting in death in about 90% of cases. I think a previous physician said he had never seen a case of uh, gun death by suicide. That is because the majority of these people end up in the coroner's office. They do not come to the emergency department because they are dead. In other, in other suicide attempts by um, slashing wrists or taking pills, patients survive and make it to the emergency department, uh, and therefore there is, an inter there is an opportunity for a mental health intervention. We know that means restriction matters in suicide, and we know that getting guns out of homes and communities will prevent deaths, suicide, homicide, and femicide. The world literature is very, very clear that countries with stronger gun legislation have stronger gun deaths. And if that was not the case, then the U.S. would have the lowest rates of gun death in the world. And that is not the case. We are therefore pleased to see an emphasis on decreasing access to and proliferation of guns in this resolution. Let me close by um, sharing a story with you about a patient who is a person, after all, and important to consider in all these proposals and these discussion, the person at the end of it. I've changed some of the details to protect anonymity. This is a true story of a young 17-year-old girl who was shot in the abdomen last winter by a single bullet. She was transported to our hospital where I work. Within the first hours of her arrival, she had been transfused uh, her whole blood volume many, many times over. She underwent four operations the first three, day, the first three days to stop bleeding and control uh, and sew holes, uh, sew bullet holes in her GI tract to prevent contamination. She spent about two and a half months in the ICU, attached to life support, attached to life support, her family at her bedside, and each day they would search my face for, for answers that I could not provide. After about six months, she left hospital, and I still see her in my practice. She will require several more operations for reconstruction of her GI tract and her abdominal wall. She has lost years at school. She has lost all her friends. Her, her family will never be the same, and she will never be the same. And we call her a survivor. One bullet. This is preventable harm. We must and we can do more. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from this, for the speaker? Okay. Thank you for your deputation. I'd like to call Dr. Kevin Chan, the Hospital for Sick Children. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Council. Um, my name is Dr. Kevin Chan, and as said, I'm a pediatric emergency doctor at SickKids. Uh, I'm also part of the Canadian Doctors for Protection from Guns. My story and why I'm interested started 14 years ago when I was walking through an emergency department at Humber River Finch at the time. When I saw a four-year-old little boy uh, on a stretcher with a doctor and a number of nurses, he looked pale as a ghost. So I asked what happened. Uh, they said he had been shot, and being a peds emerge doc, I worked quickly, um, and within about a span of 15 minutes, we stopped the bleeding, intubated him, gave him blood. Uh, in 30 minutes, we had him on an ambulance to sick kids where he survived. He was a bystander, there with his family and friends, and someone decided to shoot indiscriminately into a crowd. He was luck a lucky boy because he survived. I was traumatized. Um, then to realize that a four-year-old boy could be shot, and I swore that I never wanted to see another child in my emergency department today. Yet this summer, time and time again, we have seen kids come through our, our emergency department shot. And it's because of that failure that I'm here to plead to you today to help make it better. In 2005, when that four-year-old boy was shot, there were 202 shootings, 278 victims. This year, and we're not done yet, there are 427 shootings and 640 victims. We're on pace for a two and a half fold increase from 2005. And we owe it to our children to get this right. The public shootings are only a tip of the iceberg, as you've heard today. Over 75% of deaths occur by suicide. And if this committee is really committed to public health, if this was an infectious disease, this would be deemed a public health crisis. We need to stop the handguns now. We need to stop the ammunition. For our children, we need to get this right. I agree with um, what has previously been said. 
we need better public health reporting. We need more details. The, the data is not disaggregated enough um, to know really what, what the crisis essentially is. We need to cost it. We need to show that there is a public health um, implement um, that outweighs the, the value for, for businesses in our, our country. We need to also build much better uh, trauma-informed um, support systems when they occur. Because I've worked in communities like Jane and Finch where um, these events occur. And it's a community that's traumatized and traumatized again. I see it in, in uh, my home area in, in Scarborough. These areas get traumatized again. And we can do better. So I, I urge um, the Board of Health to endorse uh, the recommendations. I also support very much that national ban on handguns. We need to do a very comprehensive public health approach. And I thank the committee for its time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Are there any questions for the speaker? Uh, Director Wong. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, I want to ask you a question with regard to the previous speaker, Ms. Shepherd, talked about the issue of survivors, the parental piece. Is the Hospital for Sick Children has a robust, comprehensive, because you guys are regional children's trauma center, providing support for the family? Because in our report, we focus a lot on guns, banning the gun. So does the Hospitals of Sick Children is leading the way in terms of service and support for those family, the siblings, the parents? You just talked about your mm. patients, the five-year-old. There must be siblings there. So do you guys have the program that we need to be supporting? We do have support systems and structures in, in place to, to allow that to occur. Um, but I think it goes broader than in, than that. It, it really goes back, so we can do um, the individual and, and the family structure, but when it comes to actually supporting the community and um, that side of things, I think that's a real missing piece that needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else uh, to question? Seeing none, thank you. I'd like to call upon Dr. Colin Su Chu Lam. I would just say that when you wear a tie like that, everyone knows you're a pediatric <laughs> surgeon. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for wearing that tie today. Nice to see you. Uh, the clock is starting. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to the Board of Public Health and uh, Councillor Wong Tam for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Colin Suchu Lam. I'm a general surgery resident training here at the University of Toronto. I'm also a graduate student researcher and a, a citizen of Toronto who's lived here all my life. And I wanted to share my experience with community violence from all of those perspectives. Um, so in my education as a general surgery resident, I spent a lot of time in the trauma bay. And you know, when a young man comes in who's been shot, victimized by guns or community violence, whether they've been stabbed, um, you know, we're taught to do a lot, and oftentimes we can do a lot of good. But in another sense, uh, it's heartbreaking no matter the outcome, because when these victims of community violence arrive in the trauma bay, it's already too late. The arrival in the trauma bay represents, to me, a failure of, a, of our system to provide, with, to provide them with the social and economic opportunities that they deserve as a resident of one of the richest countries in the world. It's the result of a system that continues to allow the richest Canadians to live five years on average longer than the poorest Canadians. In a system where there continue to be significant racial discrimination in pay, employment, and policing. And where nearly two million Canadians' families spend more than 30% of their income on housing. And as a researcher, as a physician in training, and as a citizen, I believe that Toronto and Canada at large can and must do more to address the marginalization and inequality at the root of community violence. The recommendations from the Medical Officer of Health make it clear that the way forward is using the internationally recognized, evidence-based, and multi-pronged public health approach to reduce harm from community violence, uh, which includes violence from guns. A public health approach to community violence, as outlined in the recommendations from the uh, Medical Officer of Health, uh, means that researchers have access to robust data to understand the scope of the problem, to develop and target solutions, and as others have mentioned previously, as a researcher from a, uh, an academic perspective, it's really important um, that we're able to disaggregate data along um, you know, important social lines. 
Um, the city must meaningfully engage as it plans to with communities, giving them the resources they need to make themselves whole again and provide all of the residents with access to a decent life. The city must also be supported by strong federal legislation that reduces access to firearms. As others have mentioned, it is an important determinant of, uh, of violence. We know that firearms are more lethal than other types of weapons, and that's a fact. These bans will also reduce harm from accidental injury, domestic violence, and suicide, as others have mentioned. So as a physician, a researcher, and as a citizen, I think these are important steps in implementing a public health approach to community violence. With, the, with this approach, we can work to eliminate the upstream causes of violence before they result in a visit to the trauma bay. Uh, as a, so I, I'm happy to present my strongest support for the Toronto Board of Health to adopt the recommendations of the medical officer. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, you do have a question from Director Wong. Thank you for your deputation, uh, Dr. Suchu Lam. And I'll call you Colin because Colin was uh, one of my medical students. Um, my question is, is that when we see um, community violence and gun violence, everyone is traumatized. Um, and I think the healthcare providers are also traumatized. Uh, and as a training um, trauma surgeon, um, are there supports within, within the academic institution to support healthcare providers like yourself and everyone else in the trauma bay? You make a very good point that, um, you know, seeing this kind of violence over and over again is not easy. And I think that there is an increase in recognition in medical education that there need to be better supports for people to manage not just trauma from experiencing, you know, the trauma bay, but there are lots of ways that um, medical trainees, uh, you know, suffer from, uh, you know, moral crises and, and face a lot of hardship um, in their job. So. Um, I think that there are resources available, uh, absolutely, at the university. Is there a culture that encourages people to seek these resources and makes them um, highly public and proactive? I'm not certain about that, but I think we're on the right track. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for the speaker? Okay, seeing none, thank you. I'd like to call Evelyn Fox, Communities for Zero Violence. Evelyn, welcome. Thank you. And nice to see you when you're ready, of course, you know, four minutes on the clock. So I'm also, I'm the co-founder of Communities for Zero Violence, but my son Kissinger Gunn was murdered September 11, 2016. So I'm, I'm speaking more of, um, someone who's a survivor and the impacts of what trauma has done to myself and my family. Um, I'm, I'm speaking more to um, number four, recommendation four, that uh, talks about the services that are being, that would, is suggested to be provided within the hospitals. Um, as a survivor, I feel that addressing gun violence and its impacts, um, first of all, should have healing hubs, not to be provided in the hospitals. Hospitals, I don't want to go near a hospital. It gives me severe anxiety, and even to, I can't even drive past St. Mike's Hospital without having a panic attack. So um, the last place a survivor or even a victim who has spent a duration of time in the hospital, the last place they want to be to get service is in a hospital. So what I would suggest is community hubs throughout the city that have wraparound programs that have um, community healing within that community that is led by the community culturally specific for that community because every one of our communities across the city has a different makeup. Um, I also have had a really difficult time finding support for myself and my family. I have gone through three different psychiatrists at Centenary Hospital. They are very impersonal and gave me incorrect referrals to um, grief groups that had nothing to do with homicide or even child loss for that matter. Put me into mindful meditation when I told them that I was having chronic flashbacks of my son's death. And uh, 
which gave me a severe panic attack and I couldn't even return back to the hospital. So when we think about how we deal with survivors, it's extremely important to get other survivors input on what they feel is right for them. Um, majority of the survivors that I've spoken with don't want to be anywhere close to a hospital. Um, I also wanted to, to touch on, this is my then 13 year old son who is standing over my older son's casket. Evelyn, if you want to put that onto the overhead projector, uh, our AV staff will then put it onto the screen. And just have it facing yourself as if you'd be looking at the photo. There you go. So it's a picture of my son, my youngest brother, his wife, and my niece who was then nine. The impact that this has had on my son He doesn't care about life anymore. He went from being almost a straight-A student involved in soccer, basketball, and volleyball in school through his entire education up to grade eight. After this, he doesn't mentor the younger kids anymore. He's barely passing in school. He's been to four different high schools because none of the high schools have support available to him. There's no child and youth workers available in the schools. He doesn't have any male mentors that can connect with him to deter him from repeating the cycles. He has thoughts of suicide. He, have thought, he has thoughts of homicide. And he doesn't care about anything. He smokes weed from morning to night to try and suppress the thoughts of retaliation that he thinks about every day, all day long. Okay. So if I can have your final thoughts. He's just one person. He's had three other friends killed since my son's homicide. This is one child that is struggling with the trauma of a, a deceased family member and friends. That doesn't even equate to the countless numbers of people throughout our communities that are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis with, the, with, with this experience. And with what Dr. Chan said, we need to do this right. We need to do this right by our children and our community members because it's their lives that are at risk. Thank you very much. Um, any questions for our speaker? Evelyn, with our thanks. I'd like to call upon Ken Price, uh, Danforth Families for Safe Communities. Thank you. I was going to say Councillor Wan Tam, but we seem to have had a change of any at the front of the room. Anyway. Sorry about that. Every oh, once in a while, even the great Councillor Wang Tam needs to take a bit of a break. So I'm happy to, to Councillor Layton, take her happy, spot. To, happy to speak to the, to the group. Thank you. If the three of you could uh, just um, introduce 100%. yourself so that we have you on. So, so I'm the speaker, but, I, but I'm representing a group of people and uh, partly represented here, Claire Smith and uh, Tilly Gray, who are also part of the group, but I will be the one that's speaking and I've chewed up 30 seconds, so I better get moving. So I'm Ken Price go. and I represent a group uh, that was affected by the Danforth shooting, which happened about a year and a half ago. And we're here to reinforce some of the things that have been said, but make some additional points. I first of all, I want to thank the Board of Health for bringing a public health lens to this, because as was stated, harm reduction really is the goal and the outcome that we're, we're looking for uh, as well as an outcome of what we experienced. You know, when violence is visited on a neighborhood in a mass shooting or when a single person's life is un needlessly taken, it inflicts a multiplier of harm. And this has been articulated a couple of times and you've heard studies we could add. There was a 2012 study by the Justice Department that also attempted to monitor or uh, articulate in monetary terms what, the, what that is because there will be a, com a competition for resources. That's what it's going to come down to as part of the discussion. This order of magnitude is $3 billion a year. You heard other figures as well. In, in our terms, that means there's 
adequate financial um, argument to be made to, um, to deal with this. But it's also about the pain and suffering you heard. There's a multiplier of harm that's even greater in human terms. The effects are well articulated by some of the groups you've heard from. In our case, you know, six minutes by a shooter injured 13 people, my daughter amongst them. There were two young women who were killed. There was a community that was turned on its head. Um, and for those that witnessed and are still dealing with this. And I think uh, the discussion around trauma, which is part of the recommendation, is an important one. I can say that in our experience, it was difficult, even acting as a group, to try to find the right kinds of resources, affordable resources, the right, making the right connection. And that's um, an area that we would like to see um, uh, addressed in terms of some of the recommendations here. I also want to say that we do stand uh, with the other groups that are going to talk about root causes of violence, absolutely. Uh, we believe that that was part of the issue that we faced. In fact, we had a person who fell on the margins of society. I'm certainly not going to apologize for this person, but through the Toronto Police report, it's very clear that this person was shunted from agency to agency with really no intervention at the right time. He filled his heart full of hate. He got a hold of a gun he never should have been able to get a hold of, and he acted. Six minutes and then ended his own life, which is also a tragedy. So at the end of the day, these things need to be addressed um, in a holistic manner, and I think uh, that was a useful part of our story. Another part of our story is the fact that this is a national story because the gun started in Saskatchewan. It started by a retailer who imported the gun perfectly legally. The fact that the gun was here at all, that kind, that format of gun, and I think that's what the, is lost in this, is this is not really, there's no group that's saying that no guns should be allowed in Canada. That's not really what we're saying. What we're saying is that handguns, which are easily concealed, such as in our case, because this person could move from one part of the city to the other, undetected by his family or anyone else, until he acted. It's because of the format of the weapon that he chose. It was also a format that he was able to buy accessories for, for some reason, on a credit card that was also unchecked. And so that may, meant the capacity for uh, the amount that he was able to shoot was increased as a result of that. So there are holes in the gun legislation. We believe that that format of gun, handguns, the format of guns that allow for rapid fire, uh, whatever you want to call it, assault, assault rifle, these really have no place in the world of sports shooting or hunting. When we engage with other groups, which I've talked to, they don't see any place in that and they can be eliminated. We completely support that. And we also would say that while we would commend Toronto putting a flag in the middle of its city and saying, yes, this is something that should happen in the city, that our story alone should tell you that a, a, a municipal ban would not have prevented a, an illegal gun from falling into the hands of, of this particular uh, individual. We note a news item from Kitchener on November the 4th where uh, a person has been arrested because they had 250 guns and 200,000 rounds of ammunition in their home. And what possible explanation could there be from that? And this is a licensed gun owner. So in short, we encourage and thank the Board of Health for taking a broad perspective on this. We encourage that legislation around handgun and assault rifle ownership needs to be part of that. We encourage and support that a broader health uh, perspective and root causes need to, be, need to be dealt with. And if there's one thing that we could make as a very concrete recommendation, 942,000 restricted PALs in this country does not feel very restrictive to us. Why is there another one to be issued? The one thing that we could tangibly recommend is that right now that we just stop issuing restricted PALs, that we just say that's it until we sort this out. So thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Price. Thank you. I'll call the next deputy, Chris Glover, former board member and a current MPP for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you. Ah, and Kristen's back. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to the board this morning. Um, let's see, I actually got involved in this issue in 2010 when I was elected as a school board trustee and started getting invited to funerals of young men who had been killed in gun violence. And at the time, I had no understanding of why this was happening. And so I started organizing meetings. Uh, those meetings have been going on for nine years now. And it, they involved members of uh, mothers of victims, so mothers who have lost their children to gun violence. They involve former gang members who are now trying to prevent other people from following in their footsteps. They involve researchers and academics and, and just concerned community members. 
And the thing that we, we've learned and, and is that we need to listen to communities. We need to listen to the communities that are most affected uh, because their voices are so, uh, so rarely heard. And the, what I've learned from them is that they, they want to address the root causes. And I'm thankful to the city and to the Board of Health for actually taking this approach. Uh, when I, I actually, when I was on the school board, I asked to sit on this committee because I wanted to bring forward a public health approach to gun violence. And I did some research and I presented the research about a year and a half ago here, and it showed that the impacts of exposure to community violence start before birth. Uh, there's an increased rate, the research shows there's an increased rate of preterm birth and low birth weight of children who are born in, low, in uh, violent communities. There's also an impact on, on school performance and on the ability of parents to maintain healthy relationships. And you've heard some of that from, from some of the mothers who've, who've lost children here today. So I think the city is actually taking many steps in the right direction, including just this conversation about a public health approach that recognizes that gun violence is a symptom of deeper social and economic problems. And if we don't address those deeper social and economic problems, we will never get rid of gun violence. Uh, so, you know, I think the city's taking the right steps, the poverty reduction strategy, the affordable housing strategy, the way you're handling the opioid epidemic. Um, and I also want to thank you for the Towards Peace, where you're actually going to be hiring people from low-income communities with li lived experience to go and to try to broker peace deals in those communities to find nonviolent solutions to the, to the conflict. Um, I have, for the last year, I've been a member of provincial parliament, and I've got to say that I'm absolutely appalled with the direction that the current government is taking. It's actually feeding the root causes of gun violence, uh, and starting with poverty and the, and the growing gap between rich and poor. They canceled the basic minimum income pilot. They cut funding for victim imports. In, in, uh, victim support services. They've cut $25 million from youth programs, including Focus on Youth uh, and other programs that provide after-school programming in low-income communities. They've cut 30% or $133 million out of the legal aid budget. They've made OSAP cuts, which means that college and university is less affordable for many students uh, from low-income communities, and it, and it particularly hits them. Uh, so. I would, I would like to thank the board for what they're doing and urge the province to reverse some of these decisions. And I know this is in uh, recommendation number four, so I would like to suggest that you ask the province to restore funding to the Criminal Injuries uh, Compensation Board, restore funding to the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, declare the opioid crisis a public health emergency, and take other steps to take a public health approach to gun violence. And finally, I'd just like to close by talking about the trauma that you've heard about today. And that needs to be addressed. And that's where we really need to listen to, to communities and to parents about addressing this trauma because that trauma feeds back into the cycle of violence. And if we don't deal with that trauma, we will never break that cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, you did such a good job. There's no questions for okay. okay. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Jasmine Raz. Ramsey uh, Reze. Sorry, Jasmine, I did such a bad job there. <laughs> um, thank you for having me. So my name is Jasmine Ramsey Rezai, and I am the manager of Advocacy at YWCA Toronto, which is one of the city's oldest and largest multi-service women's organizations. YWCA Toronto offers permanent housing, shelters, employment programs, newcomer supports, and programs for girls and teen mothers. We operate in 11 locations across the city, including in Scarborough and Rexdale. As an organization committed to serving and empowering women, and as an organization committed to social and racial justice, we feel it is important to speak here today in support of the Medical Officer of Health's recommendations for two main reasons. The first reason is that we have actually been an active member of Canada's gun control movement for the past 30 years. As part of the Coalition for Gun Control, we have made the connection between gender-based violence and guns. Guns figure prominently in intimate partner violence and guns are often implicated in femicide 
and a misogynist killing spree such as the one on December 6, 1989 at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. The presence of a firearm in a home also increases the likelihood of a woman being killed if there is abuse by 500%. The second and more pressing reason we are here today is that as a Toronto-based organization, we are also very concerned about rising gun violence in our city. The communities we work with have been directly impacted by gun violence. Our staff members have been directly impacted by gun violence. And when we look at who is disproportionately impacted, it is important to highlight both the racial and gender dimensions of this social problem. Um, so we recently applied a gender equity lens to conduct research into the impacts of gun violence in the communities we serve, um, the findings of which are captured in our report, The Forgotten Victims of Gun Violence. You can find it online. And um, what we found is that grief and healing journeys for black women and girls are complicated due to the intersections of racism, sexism, and socioeconomic inequities as if the tragic loss of a son, a brother, a cousin, a father, or a friend isn't devastating enough, women are forced to mourn while also fighting for positive legacies and counteracting racial stigmas associated with gun violence. Um, they're expected to heal from tragedy and deal with trauma while caring for their families, while remaining pillars of their communities, uh, and while navigating layers of systemic racism and oppression with very few government supports. What we also found is that the needs of racialized girls and young women have been overlooked in discussions of gun violence and community solutions to violence. Why did we say Toronto operates a girls' centre in Scarborough and the report points out that some of the girls we serve have been impacted by community violence but receive limited supports and have few spaces to access girl-positive, culturally competent care? This reality adds additional pressures on our frontline staff to address multiple forms of trauma while providing programming, representing a challenge for our organization because A, we do not receive any level of government funding for our girls' programs, and B, because our staff are not trained mental health workers, so they're not fully equipped to provide culturally sensitive mental health care. So serious funding and service gaps exist stemming from the fact that gun violence is not viewed as a women's issue even though women and girls are directly impacted. Um, so gun violence really requires all levels of government to apply an intersectional equity lens to funding and policy decisions. It requires the media to critically examine the root causes of violence. It requires our society to sensibly balance freedoms res with responsibilities. Um, the freedom to own a weapon should never trump the safety of black and racialized communities in our city. In short, we strongly support the proposed recommendations and any amendments you put forward to strengthen these recommendations. Um, we strongly support a full federal ban on handguns, uh, assault rifles, and semi-automatic uh, rifles in our country. And we also urge the city not to leave women out of the discussion of gun violence and to really incre increase investment in community solutions to violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the speaker? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you. We really do appreciate you coming out today. Um, our next speaker is Floyd Dean Charles Friedel. Nice to see you. Let's just start your clock. Okay, good morning. When you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. So, we will start by supporting the recommendations and any amendments to those. I am the Executive Director for Caribbean African Canadian Social Services, known as CAFCAN. We are located in Toronto North, which is in the Jane Finch area. We are a black-led, black-informed, and black-mandated agency that is acutely aware of the public health concern that stems from increasing violence that is spread in the GTA because we live it every day. We are here deputing in collaboration with the Black Health Alliance and the Black Action Defense Committee. So that would be Valerie Steele who follows me. Addressing community violence as a public health concern we all know is urgent. As a matter of fact, in 2005, the Black Health Alliance tried to engage others in doing some research on what makes violence a public health concern. And here we are 14 years later still trying to find solutions to that. 
We understand that the significant investments have to be made in terms of addressing this issue of community violence. The evidence shows us that violence is only a var variable of larger systemic issues that are co-located with the social determinants of health, and in particular, income and social status, employment and working conditions, education and literacy, childhood experiences, social support and coping skills, um, access to health services, gender, culture, and racism. It has, community violence has actually been categorized as one of the many complex traumas impacting children and youth. And this was done, said by the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And we understand that with community violence, this type of trauma is shown to have everlasting psychological impact extending to adulthood without the proper intervention. And therefore, the growing concern requires our urgent attention and must be prioritized and intentionally treated as a public health issue, issue so it can get the attention required by municipal and other governments. Having reviewed the report of the Board of Health regarding the public health impact of violence on the City of Toronto, we are pleased that these recommendations signal a significant change in linking violence to public health. While a step in the, direction, in the right direction, we are somewhat disappointed that after having spent much time and resources to develop this report, it has not completely succeeded in addressing the fundamental issue giving to the, rise, to the crisis in public health resulting from gun violence, violence. And as you know, there's a plethora of literature on the social determinants of health that support this. For example, the study conducted by the Toronto Public Health identified two recent studies that examined Toronto homicide rates. And despite this evidence, the report from the Medical Office of Health does not contain any specific actions to address the disproportionate burden of incidences on black populations, specifically young black males. According to the April 2019 report promoting health and well-being through social inclusion in Toronto, we understand that social inclusion has emerged as a critical issue in mental health and social policy work nationally and internationally. We want, therefore, to apply and recommend some of the following because we understand that the basis of why we're here today is also founded in what we already know to exist in the Roots of a Youth Violence Report and that anti-black racism and the impact of the health and well-being of black Canadians is at the root. And in the few seconds I have left, we have some recommendations that they work with the Deputy City Manager for Community and Social Services to identify, collect, and review data on the incidents and impacts. I'm rushing because I'm out of time. And the, the board should also consider that this is the international decade for people of African descent, and we're halfway through it, with ending in 2014. And its theme and recon is recognition, justice, and development. The federal government has committed $25 million in budget to, on, to honor this decade, and we would recommend that the city, cons that the board of health consider looking at interventions that are sustainable, that are culturally safe, and grounded in healing healing principles that are relevant to people of African descent and blacks in this country as a way to mitigate this challenge that has brought us here today in terms of addressing community violence. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, there may be some questions for you. Are there any questions for the speaker? Uh, Director McKelvey, don't go away yet. Hi, thank you for coming in. Sorry, I didn't catch your recommendation. Could you just repeat that? Or, or you had a recommendation ask. to identify, collect. Sorry? You had said at the end that you had a recommendation to identify, collect, and something. Could you just repeat your recommendation? First I didn't. One. Yeah. The very first? Yes. One. Oh, boy. <laughs> or, or Flordan. Uh, Floydine. Floydine, I apologize. Do you have a, co a written copy of your, uh, your deputation? That I do. Okay. Uh, if you could uh, provide that to the clerk, maybe we can circulate yeah, that. Yeah, that would be helpful. It sounds um, like so as a follow-up, because they were good, but I didn't get it all down. Um, my second question is, in your remarks, you mentioned specifically um, black males. 
and oh, pro programs for black males. Could you kind of um, just reiterate that point again? Like, what do you think we need to do, or are we not doing enough, or where are we failing? Well, I think we need to understand that the root cause of this, that the violence is a symptom. People Hurting people will hurt people, including themselves. And so black men, historically, as a result of slavery and all, slavery and all of those traumatic experiences, have never really had the opportunity to uh, the attention paid to their needs in a way, their manhood, in a whole in a general sense has been taken away the issues of economic insecurity when they're not able to provide for families and have the supports that they need, leave them in a place where they find alternative ways in which to address challenges that begin very early in life. And if we do not start to really be intentional about engaging black communities and particularly black men in the dialogue, we will continue to see what we see because when people um, communities and in initiatives do not take into consideration the people who are most affected by that to help them build their capacity, they are deemed as a failure, and that's what we're seeing now. So I am saying that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of meeting with men and creating healing spaces for men in a particular way that makes sense for them. We cannot expect in the larger Western concept, if you will, for black men to enter into spaces and feel safe and then expect the kind of results that we hope for if we have not asked them what works best for them. Okay. Thank you. And thank you very much. Are there any other questions? And Flodine, if you can make sure we get a copy of your excellent deputation. I'll have to send it. Okay, send it along, and the clerks will distribute that to us. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Louis March, uh, Zero Gun Violence Movement. Nice to see you. Welcome both. You brought a friend. <laughs> Are you both? Uh... No, 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 he's not talking. He's just he's okay. helping me. Okay, great. Thank you. When you're ready. My name is Louis March. I'm the founder of the Zero Gun Violence Movement. It's a collaboration of over 40 different organizations, agencies, and programs across the city of Toronto that work towards this very bold and ambitious objective of zero gun violence. Most of you in the room think I'm crazy because they don't think it's possible. But my response to you to my wife, my mother, my friends, is that we already have zero gun violence in the city of Toronto. But it only exists in certain communities for certain people. So if they can have zero gun violence in Rosedale, why can't we have it in Rexdale? What's going on in Rosedale that is not going on in Rexdale? And what's going on in Rexdale that is not going on in Rosedale? Like I'm not a rocket scientist, I'm not a brain surgeon, but if the city of Toronto, as resourceful as we are, cannot figure this out, we got a problem. Zero gun violence movement works across the city. Everybody that works with us are volunteers. Everybody that works with us have a full-time job doing something else. But they decide that they want to work with us towards this objective. The first slide I'm going to present to you is not to scare, the shit, to scare you. Uh, <laughs> it's to show you some numbers. Over the last five years in the city of Toronto, we've had 2,119 shootings. Victims, people being shot, 3,096. That's data from 2014 up to 2019, November the 9th. Homicides, 220. People have been buried due to gun violence. we got a problem because those numbers just are the tip of the iceberg. When we talk about trauma, for every one of those shootings, for every one of those victims, for every one of those homicides, you multiply it by 10. And you'll get the real information of what's going on. Zero Gun Violence Movement works with mothers who have lost children to gun violence, but we also work with people that have been responsible for it. People that have done the crime, done the time, and want to make a difference. Our perspective on the gun violence problem is going to be different from somebody working in an office nine to five. On a daily basis, we will see the good, the bad, and the ugly in the city of Toronto. For us, 
Visiting three different communities in one day is not unusual, it's normal. We go into communities and we work with the people as needed. Next one, please. When I talk about trauma, if there's a shooting in a school, a knifing in a school, a violent incident in a school at nine o'clock in the morning, by 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, we send in a trauma team because we understand the importance of dealing with trauma initially, quickly. When you throw a rock into a pond, you get a big splash and the ripples come out. But over a period of time, it subsides and the pond comes back to normal. When you're talking about gun violence and trauma, when you throw that rock into the pond, the ripples come out and they continue and it will never come back to normal. And that's trauma affecting everybody, whether you like it or not. That picture was taken in 2017. It was a playground in Chester Lee, hot summer day, not one child there. Next one. You, you have to wrap up, I apologize. Yep. Two years later, different part of the city, Lawrence Heights, another picture, a playground, no children. Communities are traumatized. Children are traumatized, and you will never see them out having fun being children if we do not deal with it. So I give credit to the Toronto Board of Health for looking at it as a public health issue. I'm hoping that you can bring your resources and means to the table. This is Toronto. It has become a city of cities. And depending on what city you live will dictate your health and well-being. That's the reality. When a 15-year-old says he, he fears living more than he fears dying, how did that happen? That's trauma. It needs to be dealt with. You guys have opened the door. We will work with you to make sure that we do the right thing because a lot of work is being done with no results. Please make sure that the work that you do is uh, informed by correct data because there's a lot of data out there that doesn't make any sense to us. Okay. Please, please, please invest in the in correct use of the data. The report that was presented was a report on reports. Start thinking about getting some primary research where you actually speak to the people that are involved. I'm going to wrap up, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions for Louis? Seeing none, thank you. We do appreciate you coming out. Um, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven speakers, uh, and we will lose quorum in about 30 minutes. So we're going to power through this. Um, Valerie Steele. Valerie, are you here? Okay. You have her presentation. Um, do you want to send that along as well? Just email along? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Marcel Wilson, the One by One Movement. Marcel, welcome back to the front. And after <coughs> Marcel, we'll be hearing from Julian Christian Lutz. <coughs> Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marcel Wilson. I'm a former gang leader, founder, president of the One by One Movement, Inc. I've also consulted for the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, ISD, based in the UK, on countering violent extremism, and I'm regional coordinator for Toronto for the Against Violent, violent Extremism Network based in Ireland. <coughs> The One by One Movement, Inc. is a think tank and a speaker's bureau. We are a group comprised of former gang leaders, former extremists, and organized crime figures. Our services is to develop and implement community-based programming designed around specific community needs. We are currently working in the Rexdale area. As part of a pilot program, we have launched called the Community Collaboration Tables. This program is rooted in organizing residents of neighborhood improvement areas to help collect data, then strategize and implement programmings and services to detour people or help people exit negative lifestyle trajectories such as gangs. We are a frontline, boots on the ground organization that acts as a megaphone for communities that feel they are not being heard by those who can help influence change. We approach this issue of combating citywide violence from a lived experience lens. Our client base consists of youth, parents, elders from diverse backgrounds and live in these communities. 
I'm here today to address a piece that does not seem to be clearly outlined in the proposal. This is the interrupter style approach, or what the city is calling the Towards Peace Initiative. U utilizing people of lived experience to help detour people from negative lifestyle choices and developing realistic exit strategies for active or organized uh, crime members. From my understanding, the proposal for this specific section for this section was for the city to loosen its mandates around hiring individuals with criminal records to accomplish this task. I'm here to testify that we at One by One have such a model that has had success with our growing roster of formers. I propose, rather than using a model that has already failed here in Toronto, example, the interrupters from Chicago, we, we implement our, our existing one-by-one -one intervention model. Though it's fair to say that US, the U.S. influences are prevalent when it comes to gang activity in this country, this is a homegrown problem that needs homegrown solutions. There are a multitude of variables that need to be taken into consideration when dealing with gang culture, in, part in particular, in a particular country, city, or community, where a one-size-fits-all approach will not work. Instead of hiring formers and having to wait to see if the city can get the criminal background situation cleared first, why not contract out to existing organizations who have already been putting in the time and the work, combating these exact issues, and have an intimate understanding of the variables that make the school such a challenging one. From research we've collected, we have concluded that by implementing the one-by-one -one intervention model, it, may, it will be much more cost-effective to the taxpayer than what we are seeing now. A 2015 Public Safety Canada report, Cost of Crime and Criminal Justice Responses states, and I quote, homicides on average were estimated to cost between 4.8 and 5.59 million Canadian dollars. This is per incident. Robberies ranged between 28,000 and 92,000. Secure custody for adults or were where the, intimate po the inmate population was unspecified averaged at 81,820 per prisoner annually. If we invested even half of what these combined numbers total into intervention and preventative programs like ours, not only would we see a, a decline in violent crime, but you would see a huge impact on the total economic costs, such as lost tax income, both victim and offender, real estate value where violent crimes happen, uh, frequently medical costs, lack of business investments in areas considered to be gang impacted. Social program is the only thing that can offset community violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Okay. Seeing none, thank you. For, oh, sorry, that's okay. Don't go away. Uh, Director McKelvey. You know, we're, we're cramping everybody's time, so I'm trying to pull out a little bit more. Sorry, your program is one-on-one, -on -one, so it's like a mentorship program. And is it similar to like a Big Brothers type of format? Or like, what is, what is it like? Or what would an interaction be like? We, we do take that approach when it comes to what we call high risk, uh, so active people in, in criminal lifestyle, so we do take a mentorship role and try to show them that there is a better way. Um, but we're, we're mainly focused in developing pro preventative programming. Okay, so, uh, so you're reaching, you're trying to reach as many people as possible? Through. Correct. Okay, and where are you right now throughout the city operating? Uh, right now, we're, we have worked out of the Alexander Park community. Uh, we've done some work within Regent Park, but now we're in Rexdale, Tanridge community to be exact. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Our next speaker, I'd like to call upon Julian Christian Lutz. Welcome. Welcome, thank you. I'm from an uh, organization called Operation Prefrontal Cortex. I myself am a survivor of gun violence. A lucky one, a uh, bullet in my back that traveled through two people and was able to walk away from it that same night. As we heard from the doctors here, not everyone's so lucky. Um, I want to remind everybody if, about the science that is affecting our entire planet right now. We have uh, climate change happening that could have been avoided if fossil fuel executives had listened to the science. We have people dying of lung cancer that could have been avoided if executives listened to the science. Well, there's a science to violence and aggressive behavior that has not been addressed, and if we address it, we can actually make a significant change. So, violent and aggressive behavior can be tracked in the brain. The prefrontal cortex, where decision-making happens, 
where social interaction happens, violent and aggressive people, their prefrontal cortex lacks volume, lacks gray matter. The amygdala of violent and aggressive people also is too large and overactive. We have now understanding of where this comes from. Childhood abuse and neglect affects how the brain develops. Children who are abused and neglected, we have found that their prefrontal cortex lacks volume, lacks gray matter. We have found that their amygdala is too large and overactive. Another factor that affects the brain in this way is chronic stress. Stress shrinks the prefrontal cortex and enlarges the amygdala. So we have children and adults growing up in violent neighborhoods that affect how the brain develops and then living in that neighborhood that puts stress on it. And our organization is about reducing violence. So this now brings the conversation into our police department whose job is stress. And now we have the science that backs it up that that job, that stressful job, is shrinking their prefrontal cortex, enlarging their amygdala. And on top of it, if you are in this situation constantly, the hippocampus where learning and memory happens and the amygdala hardwire in pathways that create a constant state of fight or flight, which now explains a lot of what we got going on. And to, to, along with that, you have connections between your prefrontal cortex and your amygdala that if you get too stressed out, shut down both sections of the brain. The blackout that you've heard of, that's what it is. This is happening in the brain. But there is a solution, and the science again backs this up. Meditation adds volume to the prefrontal cortex and gray matter, adds volume to the hippocampus and gray matter, and shrinks the amygdala, the exact reversal of what we got going on. Operation Prefrontal Cortex has a plan for this and a program. As I flip through our science, you see this again and again. This is the science. And again, like I was saying, our planet is affected by executives that ignored the science. Our health is affected by executives that ignored the science. Our world can be changed if we address the science. Uh, part one of our program is to bring mindfulness into our schools at all levels. There have been many, many studies of what mindfulness does for students. Beyond uh, what it does for safety, you have children that are, um, we'll blow this up, easy to carry, this is easy to carry out, improve a mental, emotional, social, physical well-being of young people, uh, development of cognitive and performative skills, um, even better, look at this. Greater popularity, having more friends, less negative emotion and anxiety. Before we even get into reversing the effects and damage of what's going on, we were talking about having happier, healthier, better students. By bringing this into our schools, we get to everybody. Um, I know we're talking about gun violence, but again, I, I spread this out to all violence. That young man who took the van down, Young and Finch, didn't have a gun. He killed 10 people. And unlike uh, street violence, where we can have mentors go out and find the kids that are in the streets, when that boy's out of school, he's gone. He's in the wind. We have no way to find them. This is much larger than just gun violence. We have to address it all. Julian, thank you. Are there any questions for the speaker? Okay, uh, Count, uh, Director Layton. And this will be very quickly, because this project's happening in Toronto now. Yes. At, what's the scale? At what, at what scale are we talking about right now? How big is the program? How many, how many youth are we reaching? We're working to bring uh, a pilot program into the schools. So uh, our partner is an organization called Mindfulness Every Day. Um, let me find their slide. Mindfulness Every Day, they have been working in this space for over a decade. So uh, we're working on bringing a mindfulness program through them as our pilot program. But as well, I am also, I'm also known as Director X. Uh, as it says there, I directed Hotline Bling. I'm, I'm well known in the community. So on my social media feed, I put up my, I did a TEDx called Message to the Man Who Shot Me where I go into all this. We've reached 30,000 views. I have, just in the social media place, platform and all my speaking engagements, I'm also spreading this message. So um, I, can't, I can't speak exactly to how many people we're reaching, but we are uh, going into it. I do wanna jump into one thing that goes to one-to-one. -to -one. If you can see Paying Kids Not to Kill on CNN, there's a program 
that, and I highlighted their results. Richmond, California, 47 homicides in 2007. They implemented a program much like one-to-ones, which is a mentorship program with a twist. They did a uh, fellowship program, and if the kids matched the, did, the, did the required work, they got $1,000 a month. They paid them, right? And in that program, they went from uh, 47 killings to 27. That's a 40% drop. Right? So as our program, we want to be in the schools. We want to be in our community groups. We want to be in our correctional system, our police departments, and in the streets. There's a conversation to be had with the guys at One to One and looking into the program, which is now called Advanced Peace, and pulling together a program that these guys are doing, because that gets real results. At the end of the day, I don't know if we all know this, but we know this. If you're not in the streets, there's nothing you're saying to these kids. Period. End of story. There's no words, there's nothing you have to say to them that they will listen to. I want, I want, we are looking to bring a program like this through the people that are already in the, in, in the community and add mindfulness to it. Ultimately, giving them the tools they need to move through life, but also reversing the damage of uh, the life they've been living and the world they were just born into in, in many cases. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any other questions? Actually, I have a question for you. Um, with respect to uh, Director Layton's question around how, how large is the program, um, and you have a pilot project that's going to, to be developed, is this formally with the Toronto District School Board, or is it with the Catholic School Board, or is it just a one-off in, in, a, in a school or two? We, we have a lot of people that when they hear about the program want to help, so we've been, I've sent down with uh, uh, Michael Levin, I believe the last name, about bringing it in there. Uh, Kirtan Singh has been talking about introducing us to people. So uh, folks in the Catholic School Board, in the Toronto School Board, again, uh, Mindfulness Every Day has been working in this space for 10 years. So they've been in the Toronto School Board for a very long time. Um, so, I mean, people hear it and they see, they see that it makes sense. So there's a lot of people want to help. And one last thing as far as information, I'm sorry. Um, our website, op-pfc.com has in the program section, if you go to the program section, we've written two documents, one for schools and one for the police, that you can download and read uh, our school mindfulness program and our mindful police program that has not only this information that I'm giving you here, much more, and as well links to all the science. If you have any questions or if you want to check out the studies yourself, it's all there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was very helpful. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Patience Eva Baru. Nice to see you, Patience. And actually, before you speak, I think I'm going to just take the opportunity to move a motion, if you just give me a minute, or, or a few seconds. Um, and, uh, and members of the, of the board, I recognize that we, we have a, a generous member who's extended, who's agreed to stay a little bit later to help us finish the items on the agenda. Uh, so I'm going to take advantage of that generosity. Uh, I'd like to table a motion now that the Board of Health extend its meeting past 12.30 p.m. lunch recess to allow the board to complete its agenda. And we will strive to finish as soon as possible. Okay. Any uh, opposed? That carries. Thank you. All right, patients, when you're ready, you've got four minutes. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, I'm going to start off by, this is, I've never done this before, this is interesting. I'm going to start off by quoting an artist in Toronto, Drake, specifically. I don't know if I can just, I don't know if I should, I don't, I don't really want to rap, but you know, I'm just going to, it sounds better, okay? He said, kids, kids will lose their lives, got me scared of losing mine. And if I hold my tongue about it, I get crucified. I don't know about everyone else in this room, but when I listen to that specific lyric, I find it so relatable. I mean, and I'll leave it to you guys to answer in your hearts how relatable it is for you, right? And if it's not, it says a lot, right? I'm gonna amplify a lot of what uh, uh, Director X said and um, also what Mr. Luis said, because I felt like they were touching on topics, um, they were touching on the point, rather, that if we really wanna find solutions, you know, we, we have to really be involved. We need to really enter, I'm literally even gonna leave what I wrote down, we literally need to enter these at-risk communities and speak to the people who are not just one affected, but the people who are committing the crime. Why is it that we are so afraid to tap into that deep core, to tap into that, to that place that hurts the, more, the most, and speak to the people who are, you know, speak to people who, are, who commit these crimes? You know, people say that gun violence in the city of Toronto, it's beyond us. 
I don't think so. I used to argue before saying, yeah, you're right, it is beyond us, but we still can do something. We can influence the next generation of youth who are watching their brothers and sisters live a certain lifestyle. But then I, I stopped to think, and I, I won't lie to you, it was just during this meeting that I corrected myself and I said, you know what, Patience, you've been wrong for a very long time. You can still do something and not just influence the new generation of people who are growing up and are observing these things, right? But the people who are currently, the youth, who are committing these crimes, when you look at the people who are committing these crimes, they are young. Most of them less than 25 years of age. You know, Boston, when you look at a city like Boston, I know they had um, a program, the mayor, and uh, I guess pub the, the public schools, they partnered up and they created these programs. I don't know if I wrote it down here somewhere. Um, I think it's, it's called BAM. Uh, yeah, BAM or, or so, I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to maybe do research about that. But what it does is that it, it trains young men from at-risk communities to be able to uh, live, live a life and teach them to be more manly, excluding violence. You know, a lot of people who commit these crimes, apart from the gang violence and all that type, even including inclusive to um, being, what am I saying? Inclusive to the gang, gang violence that's happening at, at the very moment. Like, one thing, if you really want to notice and, and take a deep look at to what's really happening, you notice that many of them who are committing these crimes is because they're angry, one, they want to show, they want to prove something to the public, to their, to their you know, fellow members, to their friends. They want to let you know that you cannot cross them. It's proving a point. So why can't we influence them? What's stopping us? If you take a t bunch of teenage boys from the safest suburb in North America and you place them down where their friends are murdered every day and constantly attacked and threatened, um, you signal that no one cares by obviously leaving room for silence and not saying anything, you f and you fail to solve these murders, you limit their options um, of escape and just see what happens. They quickly fall in line with exactly what has happened, what's happening. You know, let's talk about solutions. There's, like I said, there's a generation that's growing and watching the news. Uh, and they're observing our reaction to what is going on. It would be a shame to indirectly support what is going on by staying silent, right? We need to actually go into the communities. And I'm telling you right now, if we want to find a solution, we need to, to fix the youth. Um, and this issue is so sensitive. So we're going to need leaders who can relate to observing or can relate to living in a certain type of environment to kind of really influence these people. Patience, I need your final thought, please. Most definitely. Uh, all I have to say is, let the brave and passionate ones, leaders, right, in the city of Toronto, step forward and support this recommendation. Um, I just hope by, you know, by God's grace, once we, we do that and we move forward, we can actually work to creating solutions by actually being involved with the community and, and talking to the people who are affected and the people who are, you know, creating these crimes are in a certain, in a certain environment and um, change the dynamics of Toronto in relation to the city of Toronto's gun violence problem that we're facing today, but it is the youth, and you cannot go forward without acknowledging the youth in our risk communities. I can guarantee you that. Put all the guns out of the streets, it will not do anything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Thank you. That is with our thanks. Our next speaker is Eddie Martinez, and then we've got two final speakers, followed by Patricia Dunn and Habiba Adan. Eddie. Welcome, nice to see you. My name is Eddie Martinez. I'm a coordinator of a program called HOPE at Young Street Mission. HOPE is an acronym for Helping Offenders on Probation Excel. So I deal with um, the so-called street guys. I deal with those that are convicted, those that are on parole or probation, or any smaller co um, conflict with the law situation. So um, in hearing all uh, what everybody said, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to express my perspective. I do want to talk about um, that there is a need to focus on victims and the perpetrators. Um, the victims of gun violence, of course, there's a lot of traumatic you know, stress that's, that's associated with it. And then you got the um, perpetrators, the ones that are doing the violence. We have to focus on them. We have to bring them in the conversation. Um, we, there's a lot about banning guns or don't banning guns. Guns don't kill people. We all know that famous statement. People kill people. So if we're talking about guns or banning guns or, or not banning guns, that's a part of a solution, but it's not the primary solution in my perspective, right? It's the people that's killing somebody. Right? So if we even get rid of the guns, a person that want to get rid of somebody or kill somebody or hurt somebody, he's going to find something else to do it. 
right? So we should focus on the people. And the most people that are affected are the victims, their families, of course, and the perpetrators. What we don't, we fail to really um, acknowledge in a high um, degree is that people that um, get arrested for these charges will come back to society. So when we talk about community health, we got to include them in the community, right? We got to include the jails. That's a part of the community, unfortunately, but it is. Right? So we've got to talk about the South detention, East detention, and all these places where these perpetrators are housed. Right? They will come back into society. What are we going to do? So then we have to now say, okay, the, although they're, they're, they, they did some, some vicious or violent acts of crimes, we have to focus on helping them and also providing opportunities for them. If a guy and prevention, of course, is very important, so we definitely have to worry about prevention as well. But people that commit crime are going to come back to society. And if there's nothing for them to do, if there's no opportunities, they will commit crime again. That's what we have now, the revolving door in the justice system. In addition, I want to say that we want to um, call for a higher dialogue between high-risk communities and police. Um, Police now have to be, that, that, because a lot of money goes to police already. So then we, we want to make good use of that money. We want to focus not, because police is um, reactive, not proactive. Police respond to crime. They don't prevent. So them responding to a, a gunshot is not going to do anything. They're just going to get evidence and have videos and all these things. But so, so what I'm saying is now community policing is probably the best part of um, policing we should focus on. You know, um, I'm, I'm originally from the US, and I watched this model in um, North Carolina and also in New York City, where they, they now, they po police couldn't police a neighborhood unless they was from that neighborhood, which make a big difference between policing because they're invested in the community, they understand the dynamics, the demographics, they understand the culture. Most relevantly, um, they're connected, right? I used to be an officer as well, I didn't mention that, in the um, North Carolina, state of North Carolina, and in my patrol training, I seen my sergeant was going through his neighborhood, not his neighborhood, but a neighborhood, that, well, his neighborhood, he's from there. And he was patrolling. He seen a young boy. He said, Michael. Michael came to the car. He said, how you doing? And tell your mother I'll see her in church on Sunday. And I just, and I, because but prior to being involved in law enforcement, I have no clue of how police work or, you know, what they encounter. So seeing this, I marveled because I realized that, oh my goodness, because he's connected with that young man, it makes a difference, him patrolling that neighborhood. Is a better respect, and there's so much invested, meaning relationship building, right? That is already established, so there's more trust. How does that relate to violence? And I'm gonna wrap up right now. Gun violence now, people on the streets, there's a code that says no snitching, right? So it depend, regardless of their, um, they know what's going on, they're not gonna say nothing, because there's no trust between them and the law enforcement agencies. But if we redesign community policing, we could regain the trust, and a lot of these people that are on the streets are guilty of crimes that are not convicted, who didn't hit, hit the jails, people would now speak up. Thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, for Eddie? Okay, seeing none, uh, with our thanks, Eddie, we appreciate you coming you. out today. Uh, I'd like to call Patricia Dunn. Patricia, welcome. Nice to see you. And you'll have four minutes when you're ready. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm not even sure what time it Good is. Good afternoon now. Yeah. <laughs> afternoon now. Um, I'm a third year social work student and I am a community member and so this is personal for me and I uh, relish in this opportunity to uh, express my thoughts and my feelings about what the adverse effects of this. I truly believe that the government of this country needs to focus on changing the discourse of community violence and move away from the problematic singular narrative of gang violence as a primary cause of gun violence in the city of Toronto. This can only be accomplished through a complex examination of the state of the current social structure. And I really need to underscore that fa the failure to do so is equally as violent. I cannot express the, uh, enough the importance for the government to become intentional about addressing racial stratification that characterizes predominantly African Canadian communities and seriously examine the effects of anti-black racism in healthcare, education, and the judicial system. 
We can no longer accept social issues such as high unemployment rates, precarious housing, precarious housing situations, social exclusion and educational policies, inadequate access to health care resources, and disproportionate representation of racialized groups in the penal system as normalcy. It is necessary for the government to apply a concerted effort to work with communities most impacted to create and implement a plan that will counteract the system, systemic challenges that my community faces. The city's public health approach is a perfect example of the beginning of a progressive conversation that takes action to moving the aforementioned is issues from the government's peripheral to a more central view. Thank you. And thank you for your deputation. Uh, do we have any questions? For Patricia. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I'd like to call Habiba Adan. And Habiba will be our final speaker. When you're when you're ready. Uh, Abiba, I, Habiba, I apologize. Is your microphone on? Is that light uh, shining red? No. Okay, go ahead. My name, is Habib, yeah, my name is Habiba Adan, and also I am from Positive Change a Toronto Initiative. I'm also the, the, the group that uh, Mr. K uh, Chris is organizing, uh, part of uh, gun violence. Uh, youth violence has a devastating impact on uh, our community. And loss of a, a young child, grandchild, or sibling or a friend leaves a hole in a soul of all people touched by the death. In particular, a deep sense of guilt is carried by the mother, who are perceived to be primarily responsible for raising a child. My name also uh, appears in different places, but uh, my son was killed, and I am uh, one of those mothers that we are talking about. Um, when my son was, was killed, I was devastated. So my husband and my children and the community around me. There was a lot of nights of sleepless, crisis, guilt, and devastation. My son was killed six years ago, and it never left me this. And it will stay with me all my life. So to do something, I joined this organization, Positive Change, to stop gun violence and help the mothers who lost their children. When a child dies or is killed, leaves behind the whole family in pain. And since 2012, I didn't see programs for mothers who lost their children. Those mothers have other kids to look after. If they're devastated and stressed and their health is in dire situation, they cannot help help the ones they are raising and may end up the same road that the other killed son went through. So um, my uh, recommendation, if any, is that death is the last resort. Before a child is killed, there is a, so many stages before that. And I know City of Toronto, uh, they have program zero to six. So I'm asking those programs to be strength, that every child goes through, as a, 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 a um, research shows that a child's behavior is determined from zero to six or to seven. So why don't work with the kids when they are young? My other recommendation is that diversion program, 
that the police have. When a child, 15, 16, uh, steals or takes a chocolate from a dollar store and the owner caught, then they have to be, and they are a program that bef instead of being charged, a program that give counseling and, and talk to, to the child and the family. That program has to be culturally appropriate ones okay. and has to be strong. In Ethiopia, we have only one. And hardly the people, they don't know and they don't use it. So I think we need this program to be strength and also there must be a public um, um, flyers or, or, or something that the community knows that this program exists. Thank you, Habiba. Uh, are there any questions for the speaker? Okay, seeing none, uh, we thank you for coming out today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that brings us to the end of uh, the public deputations. Um, we have an opportunity to ask some questions of staff uh, to clarify uh, their report, to seek some more information. Uh, any members to, to ask questions? I'm starting with uh, Director McKelvey, then followed by Director Wong. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, my question is about the recommendation four uh, for Bill 129, and specifically, several of the deputants spoke to the location of services and that they not be necessarily in a hospital but more accessible. Um, what is the status of this bill? Do we need to make that recommendation here? How, do, how, how far down that road are they going into defining what any of these programs could look like? So through the chair, um, you know, with respect to the uh, um, hospital-based uh, interventions that uh, have been referred to, uh, I would suggest that at this point, the way the literature and the research on this issue uh, talks of this, and there is good literature and research in support of this, it's a starting point at the hospital. It need not be the finishing point. So I think there's an opportunity to engage when people are in the hospital uh, related to firearm injuries or events. Uh, many of them do end up crossing the path of health care. There's an opportunity to engage, but that is not by any stretch of the imagination the end point. It is, however, an opportunity to start. With respect to the bill, my understanding is that it is before the provincial legislature. I'll have to refer to my staff with respect to how, um, you know, how far along in the process it is there. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, the bill when we checked last had only undergone first reading, so and that was just last week we checked. So, thank you. Okay, um, and then my my second question is: How is this interfacing with? And you list all the places that you're forwarding this report. Um, but how is this interfacing with other City of Toronto departments? I know you listed the Toronto Police Services and that this be sent there, but for example, SDFA and next year they're undertaking a review of the neighborhood improvement programs and the methodology that's being used to select those. So how is this being passed on to that process and does it have an opportunity to inform that? So thank you for the question. Through the chair, our, our colleagues, many of our colleagues throughout the city were actually engaged in the preparation of this report and will be engaged uh, in respect of the work as we move forward. Uh, whether we're talking about the community safety and well-being plan, uh, we've got representatives here from, from uh, SDF&A. Uh, that is something that the city is undertaking. And just a reminder, as articulated in the report, uh, you know, community violence, and you've heard by the many speakers here, multifaceted issue. When it comes to city response, our colleagues at Social Development Finance and Administration are the city lead. We do absolutely partner with them on many, many fronts, uh, and this is just one of them. There is a comprehensive strategy that is underway with respect to the development of the Community Safety and Wellbeing Report. We are actively working with other partners across the city, and I can virtually list every division for you uh, of the city, but uh, on social determinants of health. It is, yes, so suffice it to say yes is the short answer. And then answer. my last question is about, um, and this may be more for SDFA, and, and I'm happy to, to raise this with them as well outside this forum, but 
we tend to respond to events. And a good example of this is in my community in 2012, um, in Danzig, there was the, a shooting, there was a 14 and a 23 year old that died, and, and very tragic. They opened a community hub. Um, it was an end unit for a TCHC townhouse complex. Um, it was closed down, because I guess, I'm not sure all the rationale, but you know, it was, you know, there hadn't been a community death maybe. And then this year we had one again, um, and this time tragically a 17 year old, and now we're reopening the community hub in response. And so through this and the work that you have, is, is, have you made recommendations that are not reactive in that sense, but, but kind of, we, we tend to close programs because we think they're working because we haven't seen a violent incident, but the reason we haven't seen the violent incident is because we have that program. So how do you, how do you see that we get out of that situation or we make better decisions in that respect last question so through the chair very briefly uh, this is the whole purpose of public health right our whole purpose our whole reason for being is to improve health status and reduce disparities and to do so at a population level through a prevention angle i couldn't agree with you more we must bring things upstream and without trying to um you know take the uh, wind out of the sails on the next report you'll see that we actually have a report on, on uh, the early years and the impact of investing there. I do think that prevention is fundamentally, we do need a react, things uh, when events happen, an appropriate response is required, absolutely. But the fundamental, the real uh, solution, the longer term, more sustainable solution rests, as I think you're implying in your comments, in prevention that focuses on social determinants of health, and you've heard many of the speakers that have come forward today speaking exactly to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Director Wong to question. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So through you to the Medical Officer of Health, I've got several questions with regard to the recommendations. There's no references to the recommendation to the board that this will become an annual reporting to the board because we cannot have a report this significantly affecting every ward in this city that the, this is not the one-time reporting to the board. So through you, Madam Chair, to the Medical Office of Health, will this be undertaken by the Medical Office of Health to ensure this board gets annual reporting of the whole issue of this public health crisis? So through the chair, thank you for the question. My understanding is, is that there is some direction coming in that regard. Okay, that's good to hear. So my next question here is for you, Madam Chair, to the Medical Office of Health, is that we heard from various deputants this morning, uh, early this afternoon, about concerns that we have programs out there that has not been, either not been heard or not been supported. One of them, I'm very distressed to hear about the mothers uh, these victims and Dr. Chan early from Hospice for Sick Children talked about the fact that we're not having enough resources. So through you, uh, the, uh, Madam Chair, how do we address to strengthen that um, recommendation dealing with the issue of trauma, but more importantly, the children, the witnesses, because right now we're hearing that we need more community-based hubs. How do we ensure the 2020 budget through this board and City Council, because not just this uh, item here, the next item talk about investing on children. How do we ensure that there is dedicated resources, like we talked about last Board of Health meeting about the Food Policy Council? Surely this is equal to the Food Policy Council issues that we're talking about. So through the chair, uh, you will hear, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. You will hear coming up in the next report on that which we're doing uh, in respect of the early years and also um, the necessary research that has yet to take place. There are still, we understand much about uh, adverse childhood experiences. Our colleagues at Public Health Ontario, you'll hear this in the next report, are actually undertaking research on what are effective public health interventions within the public health mandate, population level, that can actually be effective. I do think on a go forward basis, and perhaps I can refer to my colleagues at SDFNA as the city lead for community violence and the kinds of work that we're doing. That's not to say that public health isn't engaged. 
they are the lead. However, I, I, I do see that there is a great opportunity in respect of the community safety and well-being plan because those aren't specifically, they're not just reactive pieces, in fact, a fundamental component of that which underpins community safety and well-being has to do with this broader social determinants of health. Yes, it involves services uh, for those who have been both directly and indirectly exposed to community violence, um, but it, it has to be much broader than that. It has to be fundamentally about the social determinants of health, the conditions within which people in our city and in the many cities that we heard our deputants refer to live in on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else uh, for questions to staff? Okay, uh, Director Mulligan. Hi, um, and through you, Madam Chair, I'm, you know, we, we've heard, we heard a number of examples of social programs, health programs, and other action-oriented responses to gun violence in this city. Um, and we also heard that SDFA is the lead on many of those. Could you clarify what are some actions that are within the direct power of Toronto Public Health in, in taking action on this? Absolutely, thank you for the question. So through you, Madam Chair, certainly having access, like collecting, reviewing, analyzing health status data, related data to violence, working with police partners uh, to ensure that we have as complete a picture. Police partners would only be one set of partners. There would be a broad range of city and community partners that would need to be engaged. Uh, we certainly can work with other broader public health partners, Public Health Ontario in particular, in respect of research to understand what we might do as a public health sector, and in particular, what we might do within the Toronto public health context to advance public health objectives, improved health status, reduce disparities. But I would speak writ large, everything that we do that has to do with social determinants of health absolutely plays a role into this. As I mentioned a couple of times now, we have a report uh, that we're about to hear about in respect of uh, the early years and, and understanding uh, and, and interrupting adverse childhood experiences or preventing childhood, adverse childhood experiences where we can. So I think we have a number of programs across the board, uh, many of which fundamentally have to get at those social determinants of health. Some of them we do directly, some of them are the kinds of actions that we engage in with other partners and we influence their actions. Housing would be an example. Follow-up question? Just to follow up, um, can you see opportunities then for Toronto Public Health to make, a specific, make specific reference to um, gun violence health outcomes in some of these direct services and programs that are delivered by Toronto Public Health? So through the chair, short answer, yes. And is that currently the case? Is that, uh, link, is that link being made in current programs and services or is it something that we need to be recommending? So uh, I will leave it to, to the board to make determinations around which recommendations you would like to make, but certainly as we take this broader lens, a social determinants of health lens, community violence would have to be part and parcel of that and that should be and it is and will be part of our actions on a go forward basis. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll move right into speakers. Uh, those to speak. Anyone who has a motion, there's been lots of chatter about that. Do you want to go? Uh, Director um, Mulligan. Now is the time, yes. Okay. All right, I have a number of motions, uh, mostly um, influenced by what we've heard today. Um, to help strengthen the, um, the recommendations that we were given earlier with respect to this report. Um, under number one, I've just added disaggregated socio-demographic and race-based data so that we're very clear that the data we're talking about that needs to be identified, collected and reviewed should be the kind of data that's reflected in this report. The kind of data that let us know that young men of Somali descent, for example, are more influenced, are more affected by the health impacts of gun violence than other people living in the city. Should I stop after each one? 
Uh, no, just, just, just keep uh, going? Just okay. Just keep going. And if, um, under number two, adding so, that community. Sorry, Director, you don't have to read every single one. It is on the screen. If you want to speak to the rationale of why you're. Sure, prepared, sure, sure. sure. Well, uh, under number two, again, adding community agencies and other voluntary organizations um, to make sure that we are working beyond hospitals for those people who find those to be stigmatizing or traumatizing environments or environments that um, are not situated accessibly in their communities. Um, under the public health perspective, uh, just that seemed to be, and this is one that it would, I would love to have some conversation about, it, would, it seemed to me that that is a fairly open and broad term um, and that the, the kinds of perspective that we're, that we're thinking about adding are this health equity approach, approach. It should say health promotion with singular. Um, Anti-racism, being informed by trauma, being informed by adverse childhood experiences and so on, which isn't necessarily uh, Im Im implicit in the term public health perspective from my view. Um, accessible community settings is again in number four. We're forwarding this report to the anti-racism directorate in Ontario um, and then uh, in a, in a follow-up uh, new motion to the anti-black racism, confronting anti-black racism unit here at the City of Toronto. Um, again, because the term anti-black racism didn't make it into the actual recommendations. Um, and we've heard today how important and vital it is and that, that those people who are doing work on anti-black racism and anti-racism um, need to be part of this conversation. Um, that we do some implementation work, that we have, okay, so the last one I wanna talk about is the um, number two on the next page that we report on the connections between social inclusion and, and gun violence. I think that's something else that came up quite a bit today. Um, it's emerging as uh, a really important determinant of health, um, social connectedness, social inclusion, the right to belong. And so there was a report uh, April of this year by Toronto Public Health on social inclusion and connected it, connectedness and as a determinant of health. And I don't believe it has come to this board. Um, I, may, I may be wrong about that, but I think it was disseminated outside of this board. I would like to see it come to this board. I would like to see an explicit uh, piece of investigation take place, um, integrating our thinking about belonging and inclusion and the rates of gun violence in our city um, and the feasibility of a municipal declaration of a right to belong, which is a rights-based approach uh, a, a framework incorporating a constellation of rights, the right to assemble, the right to avoid discrimination and so on, um, that helps us to reframe our thinking if we're trying to shift away from simply a crime and safety perspective to a health, public health perspective, from my, from my view, uh, this is a, a critical step that has been missing, that creation of meaning, inclusion, um, and hope in our communities. And I will stop there, thank you. And thank you very much, Director, for that um, uh, motion. Are there any questions of the mover of the motion? Okay, seeing none, anyone else to speak? Motions on the floor? Okay. Um, I'll what? speak just, just very quickly. First, I wanted to thank um, MPP Glover, who was here, because I believe it was um, Chris that put forward, first put forward the motion to have public health look into the social determinants of health as, uh, uh, as, as a frame to look at violence in our, uh, in, in our communities. And, and it's really actually, I, I have found this whole examination very enlightening in my own sort of exploration of what are the policy tools and mechanisms that we have. Because I think for many people, I think many people were, were like me originally. And the knee jerk reaction is in, a, in a response to, the, to violence is write a bigger check for cops. That's, that's what people want to say. That's what politicians kind of say. We got to do something. We got to do it right away. Uh, enforcement. And it's looking at the very, very end. Like it's so, it's so short-sighted to put your, your focus on there because there's so much more that we can do upstream that is, is, is cost-effective, will get results, and in general, all of those things contribute just society being safer, not only for the victims of violence, but for everyone. And it gives everyone, everyone is better off if we start solving them further, further up that chain. And two things that, that came out very strongly today here is one, how do we address the root causes of violence? 
And I think there's been a lot of discussion on that. We've heard from community saying you need to invest in programs like HOPE and one-on-one -on -one and positive change, um, which are, have been, we've, we've, we've sometimes looked to invest in those programs. Uh, one that, uh, that I'm, I'm quite hopeful on is this, is, is this focus on mindfulness and building up uh, young people through uh, investments in, uh, in, in creating uh, better well-being and addressing mental health. Uh, particularly, and, and this is written about in this report, but also comes up in the next one, uh, around responding to, uh, to, to, to trauma and how we address that trauma in the future. Um, I just think we need to get it into policymakers' heads that for every dollar we spend on an enforcement, a $2, a $3, a $100 investment in, in preventative, in, policy redu in, in poverty reduction, and in addressing the root causes of violence is, is money well spent. And, and really isn't that the duty of, of public health? We talk, we talk about it on so many ways in public health about how an ounce of prevention is worth, what's the, a pound of cure. Thank you very much. Uh, and so I think that it's, it, it, it's critical that we, that we drill this into the heads of policymakers, that this is the direction to go. So when, when a crisis hits, not, we're not leaning on this old, uh, a notion that the money is best spent on, on police rather on, on prevention. The second one is how do we take away the tools of this destruction? And I think that um, it got lost in, in, in part of the debate, not got lost, it, there's a lot in this report, um, so it's, it, it's difficult for us to focus on, on, on all the issues in an appropriate amount of time. But I think it's, when, when you look at jurisdictions that have gone the way of stronger bans on weapons, on guns, they've seen results. Australia, Germany, the UK, and elsewhere, they, they have seen results. That our own chief of police says 50% of guns used in crime have, leg thank you, it's, 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 it's my turn to, to talk though, thank you. That 50% of uh, were legally obtained or, and were either stolen or got into the hands of, uh, uh, of, of individuals to commit these crimes. That, that the BC government has identified that legally and domestic so domestically sourced weapons are a serious and growing concern. And then the fact that two individuals went out and bought 70 handguns in the course of a couple of months, bought them legally and sold them on the black market. Those are serious concerns. I'm gonna wrap up now, uh, but we can't we can't ignore that. That's another, another space that we need to uh, that, that we need to pay attention to and, and take stronger action on. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We've got four minutes to finish this item and move on to the next. I'm just going to do this very quickly. I'd like to table a motion, um, and uh, this is uh, drawing a lot on what was said by the deputants uh, and uh, and and almost being crowdsourced, I'd say. I think it complements a lot to the motions that were just moved by, uh, by Kate, uh, Dr. Director Mulligan. I'm not going to read it necessarily, it'll just be on the screen. I want to thank the deputants for coming out and sharing your, your, your particular point of view. I think it was extremely um, uh, rich in terms of information, but also the fact that you live this experience day in and day out in your communities. Um, there should be no necessarily surprises to the recommendations that are coming out. I think that what we need to do is have an annual discussion right here at the Board of Health and to make sure that the social determinants of health are necessarily um uh, placed over the, uh, the, 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 the subject matter in this case, which is around community violence, including that of gun violence. Um, and to me, I thought this was an extremely refreshing conversation uh, based on the, the juxtaposition of how we would have normally had this conversation on the floor of council, which would have been all about policing, all very much reactionary, uh, what type of new technology can we deploy, and, uh, and having no conversation, very little to none, uh, with the communities that are most directly impacted. Um, so I hope that we are able to uh, adopt these uh, recommendations by way of a package. Um, and, uh, and I would just uh, simply say that unless we deal with the issues at the core, uh, there, it's going to be very expensive for us uh, uh, in the long run. And we're never really going to get to, to uh, any uh, 
a productive outcome. Um, but I also agree with Councillor Layton, uh, having uh, a stronger gun control uh, across the, the, the country uh, has got to be part of the solution. So therefore, uh, giving people opportunities to be healthy, uh, more housing, uh, less uh, poverty, way more opportunities, addressing systemic and individual racism and anti-black racism, and then making sure we actually don't have those harmful tools in the hands of, uh, of uh, people who are uh, marginalized and at risk uh, is, uh, is, has to work in tandem. There is no other way to do it. And, uh, and municipal handgun ban is not going to get us uh, into any uh, productive and, and healthy and safe community space. It's got to be national. Um, this is uh, getting to the vote time. Anyone else to speak? We're Yes, and I need to introduce the second motion, which is not amending any of the recommendations from the staff. I believe it's already on the screen. And this, uh, we're going to have to get to a quick vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? Actually, sorry, I should probably take it as a package so that for uh, Director Mc, uh, Mulligan's motion, uh, my motion, uh, we're voting on this as a package. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. And, uh, and let's adopt this report as amended. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Uh, thank you very much. We need to move to item number two. Uh, we don't have a heck of a lot of time. Let's do this. We can do this. Um, the power of investing in early years. I know. What's that? What's that? We've just lost quorum? Okay. Can I get the directors to stay in their chairs? We're almost there. I know that. I, I, I know that uh, director. Okay, D Dr. Uh, sorry, Director uh, Mulligan, you've got a motion. I don't. Are there any questions of staff? There are no speakers. No. Okay. Do you want to just move your motion? Yeah, my motion related to the provision of programs for children and adults, reflecting the yep. fact that we know trauma affects people. We heard it all morning. Okay. Uh, all those, any uh, questions of the mover? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Item as amended, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. We dealt with that item in, in 30 <laughs> seconds. Very impressive. Um, this brings us to the end of our, this brings us definitely to the end of our motion, our meeting. Thank you very much to all the directors who stayed behind and to the city clerks. Thank you.